Hi. Hey, how's it going? <clears throat> good. How are you? I'm good. Nice. Are you um are you ready to go? Do we need to talk about anything before we jump in to this? I'm already recording on my end. I'm gonna put my phone on airplane mode there. There we go. Yeah, I just did the same. Um, is there I don't nice. know, I guess is there anything else I should know before we begin? <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, I think I think we can kind of just ease our way in. Um I edit the show so we can start kind of just chatting and um and then I'll decide where to start the actual podcast, you know. Okay. After the fact. Cool. Um, but yeah, you sound you sound pretty good. You just using yeah, a sound good is I mean, I'm in a pretty boring background, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm in a brand new background. I've never recorded in this space before. Um, this is my first time recording a podcast in my little cabin. I just bought a house and nice. I live in this 150 square foot little cabin and I'm renting out the That's main awesome. house or working on it. I have to paint and get renters in there. But um but yeah, so this is my this is a new experience for me. This is my first time this sitting actually, at my desk. Where are yeah, you? Yeah, new for me as well. Um, my parents just moved home, so I'm in Boulder. Um, so first podcast at the new house, first interview. <laughs> <laughs> All right, right on. How was training this morning? It was good. Um, yeah, I'm climbing later tonight, so I just wanted to get a little workout in. Um, been getting antsy with the off time. <laughs> so what did, did you do this? Hangboard. Yeah, yeah. What did you do this morning? What does a two-a-day look like for you? Um, I went on a little run, which very rare for me, but I was feeling it. <laughs> um, went on a little run and then just did hangboard, uh, like weighted hangs and weighted pull-ups. Okay. It was pretty, it was pretty fast. Usually I'd do a few more exercises, but it felt good. It okay. Nice. Right on. It's good to do things like this after getting some of that energy out, right? It's yeah, like feels, exactly. Feels I was like, good. oh, to sit for two hours, I'm like, I need, <laughs> I need to do something first. Is that hard for you in general? Are you, are you kind of a fidgety, antsy person? Uh, I feel like if I'm, you know, if I want to be focused, like I can definitely sit for a long time, especially with school. But yeah, I, I get antsy. It's like, especially, I don't know, just like my back even, like sitting, I, I'm i always kind of moving. <laughs> it's good. It's, like probably, could, it's probably good Yeah, I can do for something everything. for like, a little while, but I need to like, you know, at least get up in like, I don't know, five minutes or something. But. Yeah. I should do that more. I, I have the opposite. Pro I don't know why, but I can like with, with like editing a podcast, I can go into total robot mode and just sit there and do it for hours. But then my body yeah. feels terrible, you know, like it's so much better yeah. to get up and stretch and move around and mix things sure. up a little bit. Yeah. yeah. My back always just kills me when I sit and like even driving stuff like that. Just any like seated position. I found that my back's been a lot better since graduating school because mm. I just like am not forced to sit for a long amount of time. Yeah. When did you graduate? I graduated, uh, I guess, technically this January. So about a year ago. Okay. Congratulations. And thank you. <laughs> yeah. I was going to jump to that later. We'll, we'll jump around timeline time wise because I do want to hear about, I want to start at the beginning with you. I, I don't know that much about your um, upbringing, obviously I know about your family and I, I'm fascinated by your family. I want to get to that in a minute, but, uh, but let's talk about college for a second. Why did you go to college? You seemed dead sure that that's what you wanted. Everyone around you was questioning it. You're, you're, you're a professional athlete training for the Olympics and you're in college, just kind of going through that normal routine. Why was it so important to you? Was that always a clear thing for you? Yeah, I feel like it was always a pretty clear thing for me that I was going to go to college. Um, it was honestly, I feel like the opposite of most most people, not climbers, like just most kids of like, you know, their parents are like, you need to go to school. And the kid's like, I don't know if I want to. And it was like, my parents were like, we don't care if you go to school. Like, you you know, you have a kind of like a career and like, obviously climbing was going really well. Um, but I was like, and or even like, you know, friends and family, like, should you go to school? Like, it, you know, it's going to be hard to train and like keep climbing and stuff like that. But I just knew that I wanted to go to school. I've always really loved learning. Um, and just having a balance in life for sure is like one of the most important things for me. And I think school gives me that both through like learning education and like my school was all in person. Whereas like, I feel like most people's school these days, especially if they're an athlete is remote. Mm, um, and yeah. so like, getting like one-on-one -on -one with the professors and like my best friends are from college, like that I met freshman year and lived with them for four years. And I feel like I got like a, a real college experience, which I'm really grateful for because now that I'm into the, 
you know, the real intense world of being an elite athlete. Um, it's nice to like have that, that I did have kind of that other life and I still am really close with those people. So I'll go on trips with them and mm. just to have an outside life from climbing to, to kind of balance the two. Totally. I imagine it, it's got to take some pressure off, you know, like if, if climbing's your everything, if you're training for the Olympics and that's your everything, there's this feeling that it's all riding on the result, you know, more, yeah. more so than if you have this other, even just having other interests can, re can really help with that. I'm, yeah, you know, I exactly. I mean, it's just, you can only be like, I don't know. It's, it's easy to get too focused, I think. And it's, it's almost sometimes easier to get like swallowed by something mm. than be like, okay, I need to take a step back because that's good for my like long-term health. If I want to do this the rest of my life, like I'm not, yeah, I'm not trying to just win one competition and be burnt out. Like mm -hmm. I want to, you know, be competing for 10, 15 years and outdoor climbing, you know, my hardest at like 40, whatever. <laughs> maybe That's six, awesome. Maybe, maybe 60, like Hell yeah. the goal is just to keep doing it forever. So I feel like it's really easy to get sucked in for myself. And I think a lot of other people as well to like, you know, train harder right now do only focus on this. Like when I was in school, I almost felt that like, am I, do I deserve this? I don't feel like I'm doing enough because I have another life. But now that I've gotten older, I'm like, that was, I think I'm really grateful for that. I think mm -hmm. I needed that balance and I still can like need that balance. So finding that without a, you know, set plan of going to classes every day is, is hard. Like I have to find that on my own of like, what can I do that's stimulates me in a way away from climbing and keeps me going in a different way. Yeah. Where, where were you at in the journey towards Tokyo and that Olympic journey? Where were you at in that timeline when you were going to school? Um, yeah. So I'm a year young for my grade because I skipped a grade, but, um, of course you I did. Graduated. <laughs> it was kindergarten. It doesn't really count. It was just like I had a nap time. <laughs> I was too antsy. <laughs> um, but I graduated high school. What I think I was 17. That makes sense. I don't think I was 18 yet. Yeah. Um, should be 20. 18. Yeah. I think I graduated high school in 2018. And so I was, it was the summer after freshman year when I graduated or when I uh, qualified for the Olympics. So in 2019. And then I went back into sophomore year and just did one semester and took the second semester off to train for 2020 Olympics, which was postponed. Mm -hmm. But then I went back to school in the fall and took some online uh, courses in the summer. Um, and then took the spring in 21 off again to train for the Olympics. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and yeah. And then went to the Olympics summer 21 and went back to school all of, I guess. Yeah. All of the rest fall 21, summer 22 or spring 22, the next two, two years. Yeah. Okay. Three year and a half. Cause then I, I'm, made up half a year through online classes and like summer courses as well. Okay. Okay. Where'd you go to school? University of San Diego. San Diego. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And what did you choose to study? Um, I majored in marketing and minored in psychology. Why? Um, I kind of always knew like going into it freshman year, like business was probably going to be my main path. I wasn't like, you know, dead set on anything. Um, but I knew that I wanted an education that would help me with climbing in the future, like kind of like what my mom does, um, like either being a gym owner or coaching something of that realm. So I figured like business was a good way to start. And I really liked the marketing because it's, I feel like the more, it's kind of like the psychology of business. Mm -hmm. um, but as I progressed throughout the four years, psychology became honestly my main interest. So even though that was my minor, I think like probably junior, senior year, if I had chosen then, I would have switched them. Um, and I, I don't regret it at all. I think marketing is a great major, but like interest wise, psychology really, really interests me of just like how the brain works, both sports psychology. So if I'm like an athletic perspective, like um, for myself, it really interests me of like, how, you know, can I better my performance through my mental game? Um, and then for others as well, or just mental health in general, like how does climbing help the general public for mental health? So. Right. I love all of that. Yeah. I'm so excited to see 
what you do with all that in the future. You've got, yeah, I'm excited to hear how you think about your career. You already mentioned, you know, like you hope to climb your hardest in your 40s, 50s or 60s. And I, I love that view. And I think that's something that's so uniquely special about climbing. Um, I know that you and I are going to talk about balancing competitions with outdoor climbing. You do, you do both, you do both at such a high level and, uh, climbing so special because it has this built-in path, right? Like you can, if you're a gymnast and you're on the Olympic track or you're an Olympian, you kind of have this expiration date and you know that's coming. And it's just a matter of, do I have one more or two more Olympics, right? And, and then after that, you can coach, you can do tons of other things for sure, but you're not actively engaging with the cutting edge of your sport for the rest of your life for decades to come. And with climbing, you can just pivot and continue to do that. And it must yeah. feel so good to know that whatever happens with Paris and beyond, um, there's so many more V15s out there for you to send. Like, that's pretty <laughs> sick. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, climbing, like I could talk about for hours about how amazing climbing is, right? Which is mm. why we're on this podcast. But yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, for sure, gymnastics is the kind of a great example in that way of just that your body can't sustain that. Um, and it is not a lifetime sport. You can't just go to the gym and like do, I mean, you can do gymnastics on your own, but it's, it's very different. It's like training for your routine and, you know, you need coaches, you need a team. You, it's all centered around competitions, climbing. It's like, first of all, there's also like so many local competitions. There's besides just the Olympics, the world cups, like there will always be ways to compete if that's what you like. And if you don't, there's outdoors. If you like the combination, you know, there's just climb. Like my mom still trains like in our basement, like hangboarding. And sometimes I'm like, why, why is she hangboarding? You know, like, and it's like she, but it's just, that's what drives her. It's like, she loves to do that. Love why wouldn't that. she, do that, you know? Yeah. And also she is training for her outdoor projects when like, maybe that's in a year or something because she's busy with work right now. But like, it's just, of course she always wants to be fit and able to like move her body in that way. Yeah. And I was, I, I was even talking with uh, Megan Martin, who's like a sister to me. Um, she's pregnant right now, like almost nine months. Congrats pregnant, to her. Super, yeah. Super exciting. And we were on the phone the other day and she was like, Oh yeah, I'm climbing the other day. And I was like, Oh, that's awesome. Like how'd it feel? She was like, honestly, really good. Like my fingers feel really good. And it's, it's just so cool that like, you know, I can still climb. And I was like, yeah, that's just incredible. Like what sport can you climb at like still a high level like I'm sure she's you know doing what most people can't do just because of the movement like maybe she's not climbing in the steep on like you know crimps like that are campus board whatever mm -hmm. um but even just a slab or like a, a vert where you can like learn the movement and feel the movement and like kind of feel different in that in your new body is like so special and mm -hmm. I think I was like wow that's just like so cool like I know obviously pregnancy is really hard and like it can feel um, you know, stressful, but I was like, that's just a, a really cool opportunity to get to like learn climbing in a new way. Yeah, yeah totally. I love that. Yeah. And, and like, what a uniquely, uh, cool family sport, you know, like your family, I'm so excited to talk about your family. I'm so curious about your upbringing and what it was like. And, uh, you know, I do, I do my homework for this. I've been kind of like, um, in your world for the last, you know, last night and this morning, I was just kind of, looking at your Instagram and watching some videos and stuff. And I stumbled across a gem, which is your dad's Instagram. Like your dad <laughs> is so proud of you and so proud of Sean. And I was like laughing. I was so delighted, like reading through some of his posts and stuff. I was like, this is incredible. There's so much support and love in this family. Um, but tell me about your upbringing. I mean, your family... It might be the most like legendary climbing family of all time. Every every member of your family has climbed 8C, like 514B. That's insane. And like yeah. your parents were both world champions. Um, was it, I think your dad was a world champion as well, right? Your mom was like a four-time world champion. My mom was a four-time world champion and my dad was like a several-time World Cup winner, but I okay. don't think he was a champion. Okay. Don't. don't <laughs> Sorry, DJ. <laughs> he probably doesn't even know. Honestly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, that, I mean, that's a tangent, but like, do all the competitions just run together? I'm sure there's ones that absolutely stand out, but is yeah, it hard to keep track? Some that stand out, but 
it can be like sometimes when I think back, I'm like, wait, what, what, what year was that? What was that? You okay, know? That's good. Cause I can't keep track. So it's good that. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you ask me like a, a climb, you know, of whatever, even mm. a year ago, I'm like, I don't remember that. And then I watch a video. I'm like, Oh, that was fun. <laughs> <I like that>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But what, what was the family, what was family life like as a kid? And what I kind of ultimately am curious about and want to work towards is um, you know, this passion, this sport, this hobby, this pastime, this lifestyle is just handed to to all of us as kids, right? Like we grow up with, whatever we grow up with is normal for us. And I'm curious if you had to fall in love with climbing for yourself or if you always connected with it. Like, did you have to ask yourself the question at some point? Like, do I actually love this? Is this actually me? Or is this just what, you know, is this just my programming from my upbringing and my parents? Yeah, that's a great question. Can I pause really quick to pull up my nose? Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> mute it. <laughs> of course. Sorry about that. Getting no a little sick. <laughs> We're back. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, it definitely was just normal to me to grow up with, you know, the best climbers in the world as parents. And um, all of our like vacations were climbing. You know, our basement had a climbing wall. It was just like life was centered around climbing. Um, but I think my parents did an incredible job of like teaching us balance as well. Like, you know, it was always because we wanted to do that, not because we had to. It was like, do we want to go on a beach vacation? Like, no, we want to go to France and climb, you know, outside and bring our friends and like have a pool party. And, you know, it was just a different lifestyle. But at some point I definitely did have to ask myself the question, like, do I love this for myself? Do I love this because I grew up with it and my parents love it? Um, I would say I was probably early teen. I don't know, probably somewhere in high school when like, you know, all my even honestly college for sure, like freshman year of college and deciding to go to college, as we talked about, was a big point of like, it would almost be easier to not climb at this point. Cause I'm like all my friends, you know, they're going to parties and they're going surfing and classes and homework and everything. It was like, I didn't have kind of a moment to breathe, but I'm like, I need to go to the gym and train. Cause I want, you know, I want to do these competitions, but I don't want to go to them unprepared. And it was like a balance of, okay, how do I do this and still live my life as a college student? Cause that's what I want to do. And I feel like I did, like, I never really took a break, but in my head I was like, okay, maybe I don't want to do this. Like I'll take a break. And it probably lasted like four days. Like honestly, so I can't <laughs> take a break. <laughs> Cause so quickly mm. I realized like, wow, I just love climbing. Mm. Like there's hard, really hard parts of training and being a competitive athlete that it's, you know, it's sacrifice. And that's like, okay, well, I, I, yeah, I can't go to dinner with my friends. Like I'm going to go to the gym and I'll meet you guys after, um, or like, you know, yeah, they go out to brunch on a Sunday and I'm like at the gym and then I come meet them later and we go to the beach, like things that I have to miss out on and travel, like being gone for the first two weeks of school every year, which was really hard. Like the Dean called me and was like, you shouldn't, you should, um, wait till the spring to start school. Mm. And I'm like, uh, no, I'm starting school. Like I did this every year in high school too. I was like, I, you know, I email my teachers ahead of time. Like I'll put the work in, like I'll do the work. I'm not asking you to, you know, take work, like give me a, you know, a grace period or whatever, right. but, um, but I'm, I'm doing it. <laughs> um, and it was just cause I, yeah, I, taking like even just a little bit of time away just is like, wow, I need this just for the, even the movement itself, like mm. what it gives me, like a way to express myself on the wall, to release from all the school, to release from friend drama and just like, you know, burdens of life in general. And sometimes with that comes, yeah, like the training aspect that's hard, but like it's like climbing itself is something I love to do. And even more than that, like pushing myself in it. Like I could just climb for fun and, you know, v do V5s at the gym every day and maybe go outside occasionally. But to me, it's like, oh, I want to be the best I can be. Mm. And I think it took time 
to get there. But I've always I've always had that in me. But it was more it took time to like realize that and say that out loud. Like it's kind of always been the case. What, what do you say. mean? What do you mean by that? Like for a while you weren't sure if that was actually your desire or if you were just inheriting that from from your family and, and your parents. Yeah, I think I think so. It was just like yeah, like you said, like this is what I grew up with. This is what mm-hmm. I do. Like you have to take a step back to be like do I want to do this? You mm-hmm. know? And then it's like, oh, yeah, like I, I, I love my life. Like I live an incredible life. I'm very privileged. Um, but yeah, sometimes you can be really privileged in doing something and you're like, wait, I'm not enjoying this, you know? And so I was mm-hmm. really grateful that I, I do. And I think most of it came from not even the fact that I was so surrounded by climbing as a kid, but even, and like my parents, it wasn't necessarily the time, but it was the like quality of time with climbing and with my family. That's cool. Like, how much they love it you know like my mom is like I said a diehard my dad as well of just like the pure movement and joy and like what they gained experience wise from competitions and outdoors and yeah it was just always like we get to go climbing it's not Mm. like we have to go climbing and so seeing how much they love the sport was like of course I'm gonna love it (laughs) you know it was like people think it's coincidence and like I mean it could be but I think it's really just like their love really showed through growing up. I mean, their love for us is like in- really incredible and their love for climbing, it's like not far from it. So how can you see someone love something that much and not fall in love oh, with that's, it for yourself? That's beautiful. I love that. Did that, did that, yeah. Did that ever get more challenging when your mom stepped into more of a coaching role for you? Like your parents start ABC, ABC climbing, um, yeah. basically to give you and Sean a platform, like a, a space to be able to explore and lean into your climbing and, you know, um, train with other kids and, and grow in that environment from a really young age with peers and be able to compete. Um, yeah. yeah. What, did, did that, I mean, I imagine I'm, I'm like projecting, but so many, yeah, things just get more complicated when a parent steps into a coaching role, right? Did that ever blur yeah. the lines or? I would say, um, yeah, yes, yes. I, and no. Um, but I mean, it never was really like she stepped into it because, you know, they started ABC when I was two years old. So like I said, it was like, it's kind of just what I knew. Yeah. But yeah, my mom started ABC. My parents started ABC, not because they wanted, you know, us to have a place to train or whatever. It was just because they wanted a facility for kids to climb mm. that was safe and really centered for just kids. Um, and so, yeah, they started in a bunch of people who I'm like now really close with and good friends. I mean, my boyfriend was like the, one of the first, um, ABC kids <laughs> participants, you <laughs> That's know, awesome. like, some yeah. of my best friends from childhood and stuff. Um, and just grew up with that. And then it became like, oh, you know, these kids are really good. There's competitions and, um, kind of the first yeah team and, um, yeah, trainings, coaches, all that. And my mom was a coach and it was definitely hard at times because yeah, I'm like, no mom, I don't want to listen to you. Especially when I was a teenager, like early teens and we come home and it was, it could be hard to separate that of like, we come home from practice and it's, is it mom or is it coach, you know? Mm, yeah. Um, but I think for the most part, yeah, my mom did a great job of, we had other coaches as well. So like letting those coaches maybe coach me a little bit more, like if there were if a coach has a group of kids, like I might be with, you know, Garrett Gregor, for example, he was one of my big coaches, um, a little bit more than my mom, just cause she knew that I probably did, wouldn't listen to her, you know, <laughs> um, it took some time for me to be grateful for like the role that she played as my coach. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, yeah, like she'll forever, I'm forever learning from her. Um, but it's actually been a really long time since she was like my coach. And I think that's just because the dynamic is, is definitely sticky. Like if she was my only coach for a long time, that would be really hard. And so mm. I think that's why having a team where my mom was the head coach, you know, and, um, respected by like all my peers and other coaches, but it was a group thing. It wasn't one-on-one like that definitely helped. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. That's very smart on her part. Yeah. Obviously she's, She's very good at what she does. <laughs> also, as an as an aside, I really want this interview to go well because I just want to interview every mem- every member of your family. <laughs> this is this is so incredible. I'll put in a good word. You'll have to work. I'll have to work for it. it. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm the artist. <laughs> I want to I want to hear why you continued so strongly down the track of competition. I, I love that you and your brother Sean 
obviously, um, for people that don't immediately know who I'm talking about, one of the best boulderers in the world. Um, you guys have carved out such distinct niche, like niches for yourself. And um, you're amazing because you do both at such a high level. I'm, I'm sure he could if he wanted to. Um, but what is it about competition that really captured you? Um, and as a way of kind of leading into that, I want to ask this question. I have to find it first though. Where did it go? Okay. Okay. What felt better winning your first world cup gold medal this past April in Japan or sending box therapy? I have to say winning my first world cup gold medal felt better. Um, than box therapy. And I don't think that will stay the same though. I don't think it was because like, I mean, if you think about grades, it was like, you know, my first world cup win and like my hardest bouldering grade, but really it was, I think that I have, for me, box therapy wasn't necessarily the hardest climb for me and like time that I put into it. Um, versus like the amount of time I put in, you know, and continue to put in to like be the best I can be in competition. It's a lot more. Yeah. So I think I know there will be a day when, uh, you know, a boulder or a route that I've sent is higher than that. Mm. Cause I think for me, the inherent joy of like being outside and climbing on rock is higher mm. gen generally. Um, but those two moments, I would say definitely the world cup cool. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, it sounds like what I'm hearing is it comes down to investment and challenge and that journey, like the, the scope and the scale and the size of that and the length of that journey with competitions is just so much greater. And this is a goal you've been working towards for a longer period of time, box therapy. Um, I'm sure it wasn't easy, but happened yeah, relatively definitely. quickly in comparison. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't even my like longest project to date mm. at all. Um, yeah, I feel like it's hard to, even if it is a dream and it's, it's like, yeah, this is, you know, I, I really want to do this climb and it is a dream and it feels so good. It's like, it is only as good as the amount of time and effort you put in. And when it's like, oh, that didn't feel like that, that extreme, you're like, I want more, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, um, yeah. yeah, for like, definitely for the world cup in Japan, I mean, it was also just like the emotions I felt for sure. And like the climbs themselves and like my mental space in those moments that was like, just felt like so serene. So it was really, I think really moment based kind of, it's mm. not even the achievement. It was like, how did it feel in the moment? And like both were so incredible. Um, but this one just had like the, the world cup just had some like, like kind of heart piece. And the other one was like, just like so much joy. Like this mm. was so unexpected of like, this is, so cool. You know? Yeah. Yeah. World cup was, it hit a little deeper. Yeah. Yeah. I think so how did that feel compared to the Olympics? Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to imagine. Like does, does the Olympics feel like otherworldly scale? Like societally we elevate it and we, you know, it's such a bigger deal, but does it, yeah. did it feel different to be there? Definitely felt different. Um, and I think mostly it felt different because I mean, it is different. Like the world is just so different that you're in when you're there, the, the lead up, the media, the Olympic village, the other athletes. Yeah. Just the hype like was kind of crazy. And this is, it's funny. Cause like, like you said, do you remember all the competitions for some reason? I like, I mean, I do remember all those well, but I remember them well, almost as if like, I'm seeing myself, not like my feelings in the moment. And I think, cause it was so overwhelming and like, I mean, it was, I guess, only three years ago, but I feel like I was so young back then. <laughs> um, and mm. it was at a time in my life where I was just start, like, that's when I kind of started of like, I want to invest my time in this. And it was really because I was like, I felt like I was handed this opportunity of like, you qualified for the Olympics. When back then I was like, I did not think I deserved it. Mm. And that was a really weird place to be in. So I was like, okay, well, I got this opportunity. Like, I want to make the most of it. And I feel like that's kind of when things, you know, pivoted both like, you know, committing to take sacrifice some time off school, um, working with a um, new coach who I would love to talk about as well um, later. And yeah, just really investing myself in like that dream. And that was just the beginning um, to see like where I've definitely where I've come now and my kind of whole view on that. Mm. But in general, like the Olympics was just, it was just new for everyone. Like, I mean, no one had ever done this before. 
um yeah, i remember you were the, like you're the first american climber to ever qualify for an olympics yeah, yeah. for an olympics first yeah, yeah first climbing olympics and then yeah we were the first climbing olympians to compete and um only 20 of us and it was just a crazy experience of like I just remember being behind the wall and it was like so intense, you know, before speed, which is also just funny that we did speed. <laughs> but, are you, um, yeah. Are you, are, are you missing it at all? Are you relieved to let that go? I actually really enjoyed speed. No shade to speed climbers at all. No, no shade it's so speed impressive. Climbers. It is just a different world. Yeah. I do not miss training for all three. Mm -hmm. That was brutal and not sustainable, like just so hard on the body where I was like, I want to hangboard. I want to like, okay, I need to weight train because like, I mean, in general for like body health, but for speed as well, like cardio, um, need to get endurance, power, endurance, power, like competition style slabs. Like, I mean, the list goes on forever. And then you're like, well, you need to be fresh for hangboarding. Cause like, that's not good for your tendons if you do it after. So I need to do that start, but you need to do speed at the start because you have to have fresh power. Like it was just, you can't do everything at once. Mm. It was so much to train for all three and let alone nobody knew what they were doing. This has never been done before. <laughs> so like, not like there's a, you know, like track where they're like, okay, this is what you need to do to get this time and put the work in this. It was like, is this even working? Like, mm. are we doing this right? <laughs> um, wow. Which was a really, really fun experiment, you know, but it's And you're like 19 like, at this time, right? Yeah. I'm 18, 19. 18, 19. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. But speed was really fun of like, you see the progression, you know, it's like literally day in, day out. It's like, I'm getting faster. I'm getting faster. It was cool. Um, and just like that explosive power is like really, really cool. Okay. Like I've had like three, I haven't touched a speed wall since the Olympics actually, <laughs> but I've looked at it and I'm like, Oh my God, all of a sudden I get an urge. I'm like, wait, I kind of want to do speed. Like I remember jamming out to like, I don't even know, like really bad music, but just like yeah, insane music of like, I just need to get hyped to go as fast as I can. And like being in that <laughs> mindset is so different and really fun. <laughs> what would you tell me? What would you listen to to get hyped for speed? Oh, God, I can't even say. What was it? It was like, <laughs> <laughs> no judgment. What's the, I can't even think of the artist, but it's like the one that's like, or like, I'm losing it. That's my dad's favorite song. So I'll say that. Do you okay. Buy, like, I buy Fisher. Okay. It's like club music. Like, I'm losing it. It goes really hard. Yeah, playing that with my my headphones where I'm like, I don't like this song, but like it gets me going. <laughs> <laughs> it does what I need it to do. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people but, wanted to hear about your musical taste, actually. What do you listen to? What do you generally generally listen to for a climbing or training session? Does it depend on what you're training? Depends what's going on in my life. I would say like okay. gen what music do I enjoy listening to the most? Probably be like indie, indie pop. Like I really like, I have a lot of, mostly female artists but um not only just like really good vocals like i love maggie rogers mm. um, she's probably one of my actually she was on my spotify top artists nice <laughs> um and yeah there's like a lot of smaller artists that are my favorites that i like to go to concerts with as well with my friends um but then climbing I would say like a little more hype. Like I do love Taylor Swift. I feel like everyone thinks I'm like a huge Taylor Swift fan, which I am. I like Taylor Swift a lot, but I'm not like a diehard. I just like grew up with her and I know every single one of her songs. Um, <laughs> so I, I definitely like. Yeah, definitely a fan. Not quite Melina Costanza, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Beyonce though. I, Beyonce, I'm a big fan. I respect yeah. the hell. Um, yeah, but like Beyonce, Rihanna, Miley Cyrus, like for climbing kind of that vibe. That's just old, upbeat Energy. kind of throwbacks. That always gets me, gets me going. Nice. Yeah. But I like, honestly, I, I, I change it up. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I'm, I'm open to every genre, I would say, more yeah. or less. Right on. <laughs> nice. Um, okay. I want to talk to you about diving into competitions and specifically diving into qualifying for the Olympics. Like this is a unique, I mean, there's other elements of competition where you're vying for a spot, right? Like to get on the Olympic or to get on the U S national team, there's only so many spots and you're, um, you're competing with your friends for those limited spots. And then, you know, the Olympics, it's that distilled even further. There's two freaking spots and you're competing against all these amazing friends of yours. So I want to, I want to ask this question. This is a heavy hitter. Buckle up. You ready? Okay. Nervous. So, <laughs> so 2019 world championships, you become the first American climber ever to qualify for the Olympics. Natalia Grossman's there. She's hugging you. She's celebrating with you. And it's 
of course, at her expense. Like she didn't end up making it to Tokyo. And then a month ago, fast forward to a month ago, you go to the Pan American Games, you get second, Natalia gets first, which of course means that she's got her ticket to Paris and there's still one remaining. So we're all still rooting for you. But of course, that was like at your expense for that spot. Um, I'm not asking about Natalia in particular, unless you want to talk about that friendship, but um, how do you balance those two things? How do you balance being a competitor, wanting to be the best, wanting that spot for yourself and being there for your friends and being there for your teammates? Yeah, that's a really good and hard question. Um, It seems so hard. That's why I'm curious about it. Yeah, It's really hard and honestly, really frustrating. Um, Like, the yeah like the lack of spots and like the you know the way that it does like the pan american games i mean i'll just say it like for me flat out was just like really 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 hard like going into it first of all i was competing like you said for one spot like it was the winner like second doesn't matter like it it was just like that's not why i compete you know like i don't compete to win like is it you know the goal like sure but like I compete for the joy of competition and that just like kind of felt like it stripped that away Mm. because it was like purely a qualifying event. And yeah, you're competing against like your, your friends, your teammates, your like lifelong training partners and like, um, you know, childhood best friends. Like it was just like, I've talked a lot, this talked about this a lot with um, other competitors as well, that it was just, it just felt like really almost rude to like us athletes and the sport just climbing in general that it like made us cutthroat because I think that's, what's Mm. so great about climbing is that it is an incredible community with so many opportunities for like so many people to succeed. It's like, I mean, this whole season with different people winning different world cups is like, we were all so happy for each other. It was so cool that, you know, we got to shine in so many different ways. Like there isn't just one winner. And um, yeah, when it comes down to this and it's like, so cutthroat, it was, it was pretty heartbreaking for sure. Mm. Um, and it was honestly, it felt like so different than the four years ago. Like that was just the way that I think you like us, like USA climbing has grown as well. Like we did not think anybody was going to qualify for team USA for Japan. And like, when I, like when I qualified, I said, I mean, it was a shock like that. It was just like, especially at world championships, the first stage, like it was like, Oh, maybe someone will qualify through the Pan American games. Like, you know, U S wins. But, um, so in that moment it was like, what it wasn't, it didn't feel like at least to me. And I think most others that like, I was, you know, like taking that like one spot, it was like, Whoa, like we've qualified at U S mm. like, like someone got one. Holy shit. Yeah. Which is crazy. Cause yeah. we filled our whole team. Um, but it was just at first it didn't seem like we weren't up there versus like these past three years, you know, Natalia and I have been in those top spots for like three years now. Um, like we, you know, we saw it coming and on the men's side, you know, Colin, Nathaniel, Sean Bailey, like winning world cups, like U- USA climbing has grown so much that it's just like that game. And like, I think vision has shifted for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, I think a really hard balance of like, And I knew going into it, we all knew going into it, it was like, this is hard because being a competitor, you do have to like put yourself first and like to be able to compete, be in a space where you're, yeah, you're able to give attention to yourself, what you need, what your body needs and how to like execute on the wall and not be thinking of others. Like that's something I work on a lot. Um, But then I'm like, I it's just, it feels so wrong, you know, Mm. to be in that place where it it is, it feels like it's taking away from someone else. And especially when it was like, I, you know, throughout the whole season and the years, like, I feel like we, we have shown that together, you know, we both do deserve this spot. Um, And like you said, it's great that there's still another spot, but um, yeah, it was just frustrating to both be at such a high level and it's like, what is deciding us? Like, we kind of knew it was like, okay, 50, 50 in a way, you know, <laughs> like who walks out mm. with it. Um, and so it was like, she a hundred, you know, she a hundred percent deserves it. She's an incredible competitor, rock climber, and I respect her so much. Um, and so like, I'm incredibly happy for her 
Uh, but like that, it was heartbreaking for me at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Holding both those things for sure. And if it went the other way, like I would have been heartbroken for her, you mm, know, it's like, right. There was no scenario where it was like, we walk away both happy. And that was really hard. Yeah. Did you have, I mean, do you talk about that with her beforehand or after? Like, do you, when this happens in general with competitions, do you have like hard conversations with your friends about it? Or is it just understood? Like, this is the game we're playing. Yeah, I think a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is kind of the game we're playing. And, you know, we like, I feel like the end of the day, like competition is never what's going to set us like apart. Um, you know, it's about who the person is deep mm. down that we care about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So to me, it's, it's not a, at all about the competition and like the, that rivalry at all um it's really about like how do you show up in the moments in between mm -hmm. matter. yeah thanks for thanks for talking about all that yeah. yeah i'm curious um i want to dig into the mechanics of qualifying for paris a little bit because it's so complicated i i still, i really tried to understand it i still don't really get it mm -hmm. um you know the fact honest, i don't know either Oh really? No one I mean, knows. I, I do, but like I'm, I probably know one of the least of most people. Like, in <laughs> what? How's that work? You just like do whatever your your coach just tells you. Like, okay, this is what's next, and you just focus on that immediate goal. Yeah, kind okay, of. That's yeah, cool. it's like you know, that burn. It was like world champs is this is you know, I want to be as prepared as I can for world champs. I want to believe you know, both that I can qualify and that I are like that I'm capable of qualifying and that I'm, you know, going to give my best performance, um, which is hard to like admit. That's something that I've definitely grown a lot with where I used to be like, Oh no, like, you know, I wouldn't even say that I was like going for the Olympics. Cause that just scared me. Cause that means you can fail. Mm. Uh, but now I feel like it's, it's like, yeah. I mean, if you can't say that, if you're afraid to say what your dreams are, how do you ever think you'll achieve them? You know? <laughs> yeah. So focusing on like, that's yeah just trying to focus on each moment at a time and okay it doesn't go as planned like what's next you know and like it obviously doesn't always it's not always that easy but um yeah yeah so it's it's interesting so there's four potential u.s spots two men two women um but those could potentially not all get filled how does that work yeah yeah i mean um so there's already been yeah there's two men selected and one woman um so we have one woman spot for this is for boulder and lead um that's left and yeah if none of us were in the top 10 slash actually 12 at the olympic qualifying series then yeah there wouldn't be another okay um i think we're looking pretty good but we'll see <laughs> yeah so what's the next step for you um next step is yeah i'm kind of i've been chilling this past month um some outdoor climbing in switzerland which was awesome in italy with my brother um a little bit of downtime kind of but doing a lot of other things um more business stuff and uh yeah working with brands and partners and collaborations that i'm really excited about cool um and then training will probably start back up probably not till like the new year and um i mean i'm always training because i love it but you know, like more competition. Seriously. Yeah. 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 And even then January is still pretty early. Cause I think my next competition probably won't be till the Olympic qualifying series, which is May. Okay. End of Got it. Got it. Okay. And I'm not trying to wind down the interview. I was just curious as far as like next step for trying to qualify for Paris, how that yeah. works. I was, I was in, um, I was in Rocklands and I had like a, I don't know, 40 minute conversation with Allison Vest where she was like, she was really commiserating and like feeling for all the athletes um, just because it's going to be such an arduous lead up to Paris um, with all those World Cup, you know, starting in May. And um, she was kind of talking me through like the process and stuff and it was all going over my head. But I was just like, wow, this is so complicated and so many competitions leading up to the biggest competition. Yeah, um, yeah, it's yeah. definitely, I mean, it's a journey. It's a, it's a big journey to get there that I think it's easy to, um, what's the, like kind of take for granted, uh, especially for me, like 
this time versus last time is just could not be any more different. Like last time I said, I qualified at the first possible qualification at the world championships because I got, I actually got ninth place, but they take the top seven, but there's four Japanese and only two can go. So it bumped it down to ninth, um, which would be really nice if they took nine at world championships this year. (laughs) But so I qualified, yeah, the first step possible back in August, 2019, um, and then had so much time and you know, knowing I was qualified and just to train for the Olympics. Um, but I, you know, I qualified when, like I said, I kind of felt undeserving or like very much felt undeserving. Um, and versus now I feel like I, uh, I mean, I, I think everyone who qualifies deserves it personally. Um, but I, you know, I, I feel capable, um, and putting, you know, the work and time and even just like past performances that I, I, believe that I can qualify. And, um, even at the first event, it was like, I mean, top three is obviously really hard, but I knew that there was a chance. Um, and so no, like feeling capable and not qualifying like yet is just the complete opposite of like last time, not feeling capable and qualifying, Yeah, which honestly I am like, it's, there's been hard times, but for the most part, I'm really grateful to have those different experiences. Like that's kind of what I love about climbing life. It's like, there are so many different opportunities to better ourselves. And like, this is a journey that is, is hard and comes with a lot of heartbreak, but it's like, you know, like that world cup gold, it felt so good because I, you know, I did have so many second places and third places beforehand and just heartbreaking moments where it came so close. So as much as like you want, I want something like that, the better it's going to feel when I get there. And if I don't, the more I'll learn, you know? Mm. Um, So I feel like that's my mindset and the mindset I'm mostly trying to um, be in. Like I said, it's not that simple to just say that and feel that I believe that, you know, we all, we all struggle, but (laughs) yeah. Yeah. How, how long do you see yourself focusing primarily on competitions? I mean, you obviously uh, go on these climbing trips and it's, it's crazy. I mean, like your brother, has dedicated his life to climbing the hardest boulders in the world. And that's all he does. And you barely have any time to go rock climbing outside. But when you do, you also climb like the hardest boulders in the world, which is so awesome. Um, but yeah, how much longer do you think you'll primarily focus on competitions? Do you, do you know, do you, do you think about that? Do you have like a kind of a vision for that? Or is it just letting it happen organically? Yeah, I would say um, till the day I don't love them. <laughs> okay. Yeah, pretty pretty flat out. Um, yeah, please still a while, but, but I also, I don't think I'll necessarily like draw it out longer than it, I need to, if, if I'm not enjoying myself, um, because there's so much like that I want to do in this world. And like, so only it feels like so little time or time moves so fast. Um, so yeah, I have no idea, but, uh, for now I plan to do it for a while. Um, yeah, we'll see. Cool. Okay. Great. I want to stay on competitions a little longer. And um, that's because I want to ask you about your mental game. And I want to hear your thoughts on your mental game, um, who the fiercest competitors are that you face when it comes to mental game. Like, what is it that you notice in different competitors who really stands out to you and what makes them really tough uh, competitors to beat? So your mom was, was known your mom won her first ever world championship, like just in crazy, just, just in, incredible. She stepped in with this insane confidence and just, just crushed it. Um, is that where you get your, like, it, it, does your mental game come from, from that? Um, was it through observing her, coaching her? Do you have the same kind of swagger and natural confidence? Is that something you've had to work on? Like, how would you, what I'm trying to ask here, how would you describe your mental game? We can kind of build on it from there. Yeah. Um, I mean, just to first touch base with that last question you said, I definitely have had to work on it. Um, it's not, I feel like confidence is not something that has always come supernatural for me, especially when I compare it to like my brother is like one of the most confident human beings. I used to think it was as a kid, I was like, oh God, he's so cocky. And then I was like, wow, no just incredibly confident and believes in himself and Mm. believes in himself and like knows what he wants and what works for him. And that's, you know, that's really impressive, uh, like skill to have and really important. Um, but for me, like I, 
I have definitely always cared a lot what people think and I've kind of been a people pleaser. And so it's really hard to be fully like focused on myself and not my surroundings. Um, so that's something I've worked a lot on in like the recent past. Um, but I would say what I, you know, definitely got from my mom is just like the ability like a hard work ethic and just like always wanting to be better. Like that's probably my overarching goal in life is just to always be better and always push myself in every aspect, like not just climbing, but, you know, being a human being, um, learning relationships, just, just continue to learn and, and be better. Mm. Um, but yeah, the confidence aspect, I, I think I did learn a lot from Sean of like, you know, I'd be like, oh, I, I shouldn't try this climb. It's too hard. And he's like, why? Like, why is it too hard? Like, what if you don't do any moves? Who cares? Like, you're not going to get anywhere if you don't. Like, his philosophy, like, is always try the hardest things possible and, you know, work your way up there. Um, So, like, and we honestly do have very different mindsets. And I, I think that we help each other in different ways. Um, But, yeah, for competition specifically, I think it's very different outdoor and competition. Um, I've worked... Like, I think the mental game is incredibly important. Like probably you have to have obviously the physical ability, but if you don't have the the mental game to show that your performance will, yeah, will not mirror what, how hard you've worked and um, how strong you are. But I think a lot of it in school was really helpful. Just psychology, um, learning how the brain works and, um, and then sports psychology specifically, working with sports psychologists like therapists, I think is uh, really important just for learning like different tactics and um, even just being able to talk through daily, you know, like problems that we all have. <laughs> yeah. Um, let alone like when you're on the mats about to go out for, you know, the last boulder at world championships that decides, you know, your Olympic quota. It's like, that's a definitely a, a pressure filled moment, but viewing like, that pressure is fueling rather than debilitating is um, really, really important. And I think most of all important for like our overall mental health. Like for me, post Olympics, like I, you know, people talk about like post Olympic depression and like being really sad after. And I was like, Oh, like, yeah, that's a thing, whatever. Um, and then I was like, Oh my God, I feel that. Like I was really sad for a long time. Um, it was just, and it wasn't even like, I mean, for me, my performance was not what I wanted at the Olympics, but it wasn't even about that. I think it was just focusing on one thing for so long, like literally two years. It was two years since I qualified to then till I competed and then being like, what do I focus on now? You know, or like, who am I without that? Like, there's just so many different things to think about that just kind of felt like a weight on me. Um, and that really inspired me to like dive deeper into my own mental health, mental game of, and also my goal of like, I want to spread that to others, like build more in climbing to help people navigate that, mm. you know, hardship of climbing competitions and the balance of climbing competitions in life. Like yeah. we can't be reliant on an outcome for our happiness, like at a competition, that's just not, to me, that's not healthy. And it's not like a good reason to compete is to win. You know, it's, it's to do it. Like, why do you do this? It's like, because you love it. Mm. Um, and at the end of the day, like, are you happy? It's like, because of who you are, not because of what you've done. Right. So yeah, I think for me, it's just about having that overarching, like big picture view of like, why do I do this? And that really keeps me going. And then the little moments, the tools, like breathing techniques, meditation, um, yeah, there's just so many little tools that can help in the moment, but being able to zoom out and be like, okay, like, yes, this matters, but like, this does not define me by any means. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> I love that. I love, I love some, yeah, everything that you just touched on. I, I think it's, um, yeah, like you said, I, I love how you phrase this because it, of course, you know, the, the result isn't enough to make us happy. I think, I think we all get that. We've all kind of experienced that. We put something on a pedestal. Maybe it's sending a, maybe it's sending the, the purple route in the gym, whatever. And then you do it and 
you're left with exactly what you had before. You're still who you are yeah. and you're still in your life and all those things. But I think the thing that's sneakier and a harder lesson to learn is that that direction that you get from a goal, which can be really beautiful and really truly fulfilling, like you're on this journey and you're getting fulfillment and joy out of the journey, whether or not you actually do the thing, um, that fulfills such a deep sense of purpose that once that goes away, when you actually do the thing, like that's what you're talking about with the Olympics, right? It's like, this thing was guiding your entire life and it was your entire focus and all of your purpose and, and everything for two years, all of a sudden that's gone. And you're just left like, you know, kind of spinning out, like, who am I now? Like, what am I trying to do? What Like, I mean, I experienced this a few weeks ago, just buying and, and cleaning up my house. I like, you know, it took a lot of energy to buy a house. And then I spent three weeks renovating this little cabin. It was, it looked completely different before. And, uh, day and night. It was just like, I would work on the podcast all day. I would maybe go climbing and then I would come out here and work until late. And then one day it was done and I was like ready to move in. And I felt so aimless and confused and like kind of bummed for a couple of days. I was like, whoa, this is really interesting. Where did that come from? So I'm, I'm just trying to imagine that on a two year scale where it's not just you and your focus, but like everyone in your life is supporting you towards this thing. And all of a sudden that thing's gone. Um, or that chapter is closed, right? Yeah. So what do you, what's the bigger picture? Like, what do you focus on? What's your, what's your vision? What's your longer vision or the thing that grounds you in that, that you, that you focus on? Is it like this vision of trying to work towards helping others in their psychology and, and building more of a business around that? Yeah. I think, like I said, it's just like being continuously improving and like improving with the people around me, like the sport, I, you know, I want to give back to the climbing community, like all, all my, you know, coaching and support that I've had is just so incredible back here in Boulder. And I mean, far beyond that. Um, so it's like, I definitely, I want to give back in that sense. And right now I think my journey is first through myself. Like I can't, I believe you can't really give back as much if you don't aren't happy, like, you know, with what, how you feel internally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would say like a future goal for sure is, um, to mix psychology and climbing. I did like, I have done quite a bit of independent research. I did a class in college. It was an independent study. So it was just me and a professor. And, um, I was working on climbing, how climbing essentially helps, mental health and well-being so not just on the perspective of like you know there's kind of two sides it's like how does mental game help climbing at a like high um elite level but then how does just climbing help people's mental health mm -hmm. and there are studies on this there's like a bunch of studies um but like it's called bpt like bouldering psychotherapy where they use bouldering as a form of therapy um so instead of like, like, and it was like a community. So it's a group of people that go bouldering and then they talk like, okay, what are you afraid of? Like, it brings out so many different fears and things about yourself that you might not even be aware of. And it's like, okay, how can we work through that? And it's just like, it gives feedback right away of like both progression and, you know, different styles and choices. And like, it can be different for everyone. Um, there's just so much to climbing that can I think really help people and bring joy to people's life. And so I want to continue to show that both through my enjoyment of the sport and like pure passion, like that's why I do it. So sharing that and then, yeah, helping people more hands-on, whether it's, you know, beginner climbers, elite climbers, or people who have never climbed before introducing them to the sport and that joy. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's beautiful. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you about one other thing that you said before that, when you were kind of talking me through your mental game, it connects to everything you just shared too. You know, you're, you're a people pleaser. It's hard for you to have that fierce competitor energy. Um, and that's something you've had to, to work on. That makes total sense. Um, and you said that you, you said something along the lines of, I'm paraphrasing, but like you've, you've had to learn how to focus on yourself more or, or be comfortable prioritizing yourself more. Cause that is an interesting thing about being a high level athlete. Like you kind of have to be the center of attention in your own life and, and own that and value that to have a chance at being the best. Um, 
but you also don't want to be a narcissist, obviously, and you're very much not. So how, how do you think about <laughs> stepping into that energy in a healthy way? Like, what does it look like for you to own? This is about me. This is about this dream I have. And I can be the best. I believe that. And I'm going to like step into these competitions with that belief in myself and that energy. Um, but have that feel positive and, and healthy. You know, a lot of people struggle with that. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, I am continuously struggling with that. Like, I feel like I've learned so much, but in no way have I figured it out. But for me, it's really just focusing on myself and it's not taking away from anyone else. It's like mm -hmm. when I walk out on the mats, mats, like I, you know, am, I'm like, I want to give myself to this boulder. Like, it's not about winning the competition. It's not about beating my other competitors, but it's like, how can I like fully be in this moment and like give my, like, my best climbing performance. Cause at the end of the day, like that's what is going to make me happy. Like doesn't matter. And that's what my mom always, you know, taught us as kids, which like uh, has stuck with me forever that it's like, before you look at results, like, are you happy with how you climbed? Mm. Are you happy with how you showed up that day? You know, is there anything you would have changed? You could win the competition and not be happy. I mean, that happens to people all the time. You know, it's like you're even I've heard this of like Michael Phelps, you know, he's won however many Olympic gold medals, but it's like, if you're chasing winning, that's not like, that doesn't feel good. But if you're like chasing, like, all right, I don't want to even say chasing, but like have a bigger purpose of like continuously improving and showing up the best you can that day, like that is fulfilling. And that I think was what was so incredible too, of like the Hachioji comp was, I, I mean, I knew that like, like, I didn't go into that competition being like, I want to win my first gold medal. You know, of course I was like, oh my God, that'd be so cool. But like, I was like, I feel really prepared. And like, I feel so happy. Like I am so happy with all the work I've put in, like the journey I've got here. I mean, I went out there like two weeks early and got to just spend time in Japan with like one of my best friends, um, try all the food and like walk around the gardens. It was just like, you know, blissful of like, I'm just like so content with who, who I am and what I'm doing that like, it doesn't matter if I get first or if I get last, like that feeling will still be there. And then the next day it was like, Oh my God, you know, do you feel so different? Everyone's asked me this. I'm like, I feel completely as I did yesterday morning mm. because I'm still happy with like everything I've done up to this point, you know? Yeah. And so just in that place where it was like, it was overwhelming because like things did work out so well, but it was also like, wow, I just like fully enjoyed myself. Like those climbs I will remember for so mm. long because not because of the outcome, but because I was able to like fully be present and like, um, yeah, even I remember my music behind the like wall, like every note, I was just like, like in it where I almost, I was like, Oh my God, I have 10 seconds. I need to get ready. You know, it was like, <laughs> sometimes it feels like I'm waiting, you know, in, in a competition, it feels yeah. so long. I can't wait to just get to the last boulder or that it's done even. And this was like, I'm so present. Mm. And so I think, trying to approach competitions in that way. And each one, it's hard to, you know, live up that each competition will not feel like that. And some days I might just feel like just worse, you know, <laughs> or not quite as content. Um, but trying to approach them as like, I'm here for myself. I'm here. Like, I'm so grateful for everyone that's put all the hard work into those competitions, setters, you know, all the volunteers, that like, I want to give my best performance both for myself and like everyone that's worked so hard to get here. And mm -hmm. like, if that, I think I believe that giving my best performance will, you know, I, I think I have the ability to win a competition if I give my best performance, yeah. but I can't control actually winning a competition. I can't control how the next person climbs. All I can control is like, how am I, what am I doing at this moment? And how do I like show that? I love that. That's such a healthy mindset for life. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's it's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. Climbing is connected and, and um, everything is, is connected that we do. I'm curious, like how different are different competitors' mindsets? Like, is that, is, it sounds like you're, you thrive when you step into presence, <clears throat> when you connect with your joy and when you just focus on trying to be your best that day and give your best that day. Um, is that the kind of gold mindset to, to try to find as a competitor or does it seem to just completely depend on the competitor? Like do some people. It depends on the person. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I cannot say that like everyone wants to feel that way. Like right. people might be like, that sounds awful. Like, why would I want to feel that way? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like see that feel like it's yeah. like, yeah, that's, that's what 
you know, motivates me. And that's when I feel my best. Um, and like in the past, you know, it'd be like, I just want to have fun. Like, I don't want to put pressure on myself. Like it was always a hard balance of like, I want to have fun and like, I'm focused and I feel like I'm learning. And, you know, sometimes I think I figured it out and then I'm like, wow, I'm nowhere near figuring it out. Like mm. I have so much left to learn. Um, but of like, okay, how can I, I, I'm grateful and joyful and, but like, I'm determined, like, I'm not going to go out there and just play. Mm. Like I want to, I want to, you know, mess, mess stuff up <laughs> um, Yeah, and like, yeah, go out there with, you know, purpose and, um, be bold, be strong, be confident, like almost play that part as well. But it's like coming from a place of like pure passion. I think mm. that's for me what works the best, but I think it works. It really depends on the competitor, competitor, different experiences, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to talk, really talk about like specific people because that feels like, you know, I don't, I can't get inside their brain. I can't say yeah. how like a person's actual mental game approach is. But I think pe some people do lean into the more like, some even it's like more fake it till you make it of like, you know, I am, I am incredibly happy. This is just fun. Like, this is wonderful. This is great whether they feel that way or not, but mm. like going into a competition like, like that. And for me, that doesn't work. Um, and I, I like, that is also a, just a psychological tactic. So for some people it really does, um, of just like always boosting positivity, um, as they're like, yeah, as a way to help performance. Um, I played with that for a little and it to like, I just feel like I can't fool myself. Like if I'm like, Oh, I'm so happy when like, I'm in pain and like unhappy. It's just You're like, like I'm lying to myself now with like resentment. I'm like, God, I want to <laughs> like, you know, I just don't want to be here. Yeah. Like, if, yeah. if I walk like some days it's like, ugh, like, yeah, I, I don't feel great. Like, and accepting that and being like, okay, I don't like, I don't need to fake that. I feel great. And like, that's okay today. I don't, I don't feel wonderful. And what's hard about competition is well, that doesn't matter. This is the final day. Like you have to feel great. Sometimes you do have to have that little bit of, okay, like, suck it up, you know? <laughs> um, but like to me being like empathetic to myself and like, okay, you're allowed to feel that like you're a human being. You don't have to be, I'm not a robot. I can't tell myself how to feel every day. Just accepting that immediately. I'm like, wow, I feel better, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And like, let's do this despite that. Like let's, you know, channel in like all those good energies of when I did feel good or, you know, people that support me and like their positivity, just like feeling that kind of good energy, um, usually gets me into the right mindset, but not blocking it out, just kind of accepting it. And usually it, it works itself out. But. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, are there any talking kind of like tangibly for people listening that, um, are working on their own mental game, they might be able to learn something from your approach or they might be curious and want to try something that, that you that works for you just to kind of try it on and see if it resonates with them um do you have any daily routines or or anything like that that you do that feels important to you as far as supporting your mental health your mental game could be climbing could be disconnected from climbing or separate from climbing yeah um so i i meditate like every morning uh just for about like 10 minutes but that's been a a big thing for me of just kind of mixing the two of like, how does mental game work with mental health? Because for a while it was like everything I was doing, you know, I mean, I feel like I was, was and am just like so driven to, you know, be the best I can be that it's like, okay, this is for my training. Like I'm training this, but then it's like, no, but I want, I don't want to like do meditation or like mental training just to like be the best of this competition then the competition's over and I'm like oh I did, I'm not gonna do it I don't want to anymore but it's more like how can this be my safe space like that I go back to every time and I've been able to transform that where it's like I want to do my meditation every morning not I have mm -hmm. to of like both I think it does help my my climbing performance but overall it just like gets me into a good place where I'm like happier with my when I'm over on my parents you know and like little things that like tick you off it's like okay like just it's okay like and just like an overarching purpose like being in that space like it it just it feels like it gives back like energy to myself um so that's i mean one thing i'd recommend like i i think meditation is really important and my um my pt from san diego who's a pt and mentor he really guided me in that 
meditation and both like uh, I've read a lot of books on it. Um, do you use anything? Do you use an app or do you just do a sit? Um, I now just sit, but I have used like YouTube recordings and stuff in the past and like mostly coming from Buddhist practice and like Zen. Um, but really my meditation is just all centered around the breath, which is what I was going to say for like a really tangible thing for people to try out. You know, if 10 minutes a day feels like a lot, which it can, um, to just like, you know, really sit down and like, I promise you, you do have 10 minutes a day, but like, if that feels like a lot, just start with one, you know, but really it's just focusing on the breath. Like, even if, if you want to try it out while climbing, like before you approach your project, just like a deep breath in and out and like, really be like, I'm here, you know, mm-hmm. I'm present. Um, I think, yeah, breath work is like really important for both sports and just like navigating daily life because we kind of, we're always breathing, but we forget that like we're breathing and that's what connects the mind and body is the breath. When you think about the breath, especially it's like, that's when you're, that's when I feel connected of like, even right now, you know, just like taking a deep breath and it's like, oh, cool. We're doing a podcast versus like 10 minutes ago. I might've been like, where am I? In my little brain. (laughs) Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Breath is so fascinating, isn't it? I mean, it's the only thing that just happens on its own day in, day out all the time that we can also control intentionally. Yeah. Like what an interesting it's thing. And it's, it's so powerful. Yeah. I feel like I have a lot, I, I've, I've learned a lot more about breath and have leaned into it a lot more in the last few years. And I feel like I still have so much untapped potential with that for yeah. any number of things. Yeah. And for sure. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, it's just really cool to it helps be present in moments um, and just like grounding, I think. So like, if I'm like, oh, like I feel like running around stressed, just like one deep breath. It's like, you always have time to breathe. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I feel like I forget that sometimes. Um, and I think a lot of us do in this world where we're so overstimulated with like, you know, technology, with people, with other people telling us what to do, like, let alone, like, what do you want? It's just like one deep breath can just like, kind of clear a lot of that totally yeah when i feel when i feel like i have too much on my plate which happens too often because i say yes to too many things (laughs) i um i if i feel like i you know that kind of fight or flight mode where you just like are trying to keep track of everything and you have a lot to get done and you're just like okay they gotta do this gotta do that um i'll i will sometimes notice that oh my god for the last like two hours i have been like like almost <laughs> panting, like micro breathing, you know, really running. I'm like here and I'm like this. And I'm, and I'm si- like, it, totally. I, I'm like sitting at my desk working at my computer and I'm like, I haven't taken a full deep breath and just like, huh, just let all that tension go in one yeah. moment. And you're like, Whoa, I didn't even know I was carrying all that. You can just kind of like move your neck around and everything just loosens. Sure. Like, wow. You gotta, sometimes you just got to do the like full body shake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks for sharing all that. Um, I want to dive into a couple of the physical components um, of your climbing and kind of how those express in your style. And um, I would also love to get back to your your new coach. Um, was that Josh? Are you talking about Josh when you say that? No, no. no. Um, I work with Josh through USA Climbing, but um, with Chris Danielson, I've been working oh, yeah. with him um, since... One, I guess, probably end of 2019 after the first Olympics, and then every year more so and more so. So he's my personal coach that I work with, like, I mean, essentially daily. Oh, very cool. Okay, yeah, we will definitely, we'll definitely talk about that. I would love to hear what his influence has been on you. Um, I was out climbing yesterday, and I was climbing with my friend Jesse Firestone, who's been on the podcast many times. He's a good friend of mine, very good climber, and now a very good climbing coach. He helps people mostly with. I would say, these are my words, but their movement and learning how to connect with their own style and get the most out of their own body and style. Um, so I was, I was at, you know, he came and supported me on my thing. We went over to his thing and I told him that I was going to be talking to you and just picked his brain. Like, what should I talk to Brooke about? I, you know, I had tons of ideas and um, it was really cool to get his thoughts. He made the observation that you better than just about anybody he's seen on the competition circuit really use your flexibility. Like a lot of, a lot of climbers are flexible. A lot of high level climbers and athletes work on their flexibility, but he made the observation that you really seem to know how to use all of it and use it very consistently all the time. Like you never miss opportunities for weird heel hooks or for splits or whatever else. Um, So he was curious 
Two questions from Jesse. Um, were there any turning points where you realized that flexibility was going to be a cornerstone of your climbing style? And then do you have any advice for people who are trying to use more flexibility in their climbing? They're not trying to get more flexible with stretching. They're trying to actually figure out how to use it more in their climbing style. Great question. Yeah, really great question. Um, I would say there definitely wasn't a point where I was like, I should use my flexibility more. It's kind of just, I think a lot of it was also growing up as a short climber. Like I'm just always feeling like I needed, you know, being one of the shortest competitors. Um, How tall are you? I'm five foot two. Okay. And don't have, or maybe have like plus half an inch, I think. Um, Yeah. So being one of the shortest competitors, like feeling like I needed to use that flexibility to like either get around sequences or, um, you know, use my height as most as I possibly could and like almost use my legs as like my, it's, you know, more hands kind of, I'd say that's probably one reason. Um, I also grew up doing gymnastics, so, um, was not elite, but like a highly competitive, uh, till like age 10. Um, so that definitely helped me with just like gaining flexibility in general. Um, you and, and you like, and your brother both did that, right? Um, Sean did gymnastics as well. Yeah. I don't know when he quit. I feel like he, actually, yeah, maybe same. He where, was maybe younger. I know this is a tangent, but where did that come from? Was that like your parents' master plan to make you incredible climbing athletes, or did you no, did you want to no, do that? So do you it remember? actually, it's a good story. I mean, well, at one point on ABC Kids Climbing, every single athlete was like had done gymnastics before, and there was like you know twenty wow. plus. Wow, which is funny, but it's really because so there's this gym that you've possibly heard of, Cats. Cats, yeah in boulder Legendary. which is a gymnastics gym um what's it stand for i shouldn't even bring that up because i don't know what it stands for athletic uh, c what's the c people can google it it's fine yeah that's, <laughs> that's gym in boulder it's a gymnastics gym and there's a climbing wall with the best spray wall in the world gonna say that um <laughs> and i so rob candelaria and wendy are the owners and he rob coached my mother for climbing um back when, you know, a long, long time ago when she was like really young. And so he's a, he's a gymnastics coach, but just like always been, you know, he was a climber and just really in, like loved climbing. So he coached her. Um, and I honestly, I guess the story is kind of more coming from like me putting the pieces together. Not like I've heard this directly from my mom. So I'll probably go home and ask her after this, but essentially I think just like, you know, knowing them and like the gym and this gym has been around forever that like they put us in there probably when I was like two, you know, just like as kids to like play and, you know, good for development and learning. And then, um, yeah, I loved gymnastics and competed like for a while and then kind of came to the age where I had to choose between climbing and gymnastics and gymnastics was definitely just like too harsh for me. And mm. of course I was like, never could I give up climbing. So um, what do you mean harsh? What, um, just like strict, like coaching and um, it's the same. It's like, you know, you go in to the gym and you do the training and you're trying to perfect your routine, routine ever yeah, yeah. And over and over. Yeah. It was too much to me about perfection mm. uh, and less about like art and mm. enjoyment. That's cool. Which I think you can find in climbing. Yeah. Um, but I, I love gymnastics and I, I still love it a lot. Um but yeah, so that's probably one reason going back to the original question why, you know, I'm flexible and like have learned to use that, but I don't know. I wouldn't say I have like a really definite answer for you. I think it was just growing up. Like, I think a lot of it is really movement based, like both just from climbing at such a young age and having a family of climbers that movement has always been like the number one for me. And also the number one reason I love climbing. It's just like so cool how much we can do and like how, like when I warm up on the wall, my warm up is usually, I mean, I'll do like band stretches, all that. And then I'll get on the wall and I'll like just kind of dance on the wall. Hmm. Like that's like one of my favorite parts is just like that dancing. Like I'll do, yeah, heels above my head. And it's not, you know, people used to be like, oh, you're showing off. And I'm like, no, I'll do this like alone. Like, it's just like music and like, I forget that there's other people. It's just like a way to like really feel the movement and like go with the flow. It's so like different where it doesn't feel like I'm in no barriers of a, of a route of a boulder of anything. It's just, you can kind of like find different movements and like do coordinations that work and 
flow from like foot to hand. It's just like a full body movement um, and like kind of like that flowingness. So I've definitely dive, dove, dove into that. that dove. Good question. So you, you, you dove into dive. it. I dove, I dove into that. I've definitely, I don't know. <laughs> <gonna> <laughs> <laughs> but well, yeah, what did I do? Leaned, I, I'm going to say leaned. Leaned. So I'm, I'm nice definitely pivot. leaned into that um, a lot more as I've gotten older of just like, mostly just for joy, not of like trying to, you know, get better with it necessarily, but um, just joy of like that pure movement. And I think a lot of that comes from using your entire body, um, mm-hmm. you know, like foot, heel, toe hook, hands, you know, like under, above everything. So mm-hmm. yeah, I'd say that's probably one reason. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Cool. Do you have any thoughts on how people, um, do you have any advice for people who want to learn to yeah. use their flexibility I mean, more in their climbing? I would say even just starting like that, like warming up, like it doesn't have to be a hard climb for you to have to use your flexibility. It's almost the opposite, like learn it on easier climbs or climbs that, you know, aren't necessarily at your like highest ability, but for, yeah, for me, it's like, I like to do it on a set climb as well, but more so just like find your own path. Um, whether it's on spray wall or even just a commercial wall with, you know, a bunch of holds, just kind of flowing for that warm up. Um, and kind of trying out using that flexibility of like, how does this work if my heels above my head and going under like, Oh, that kind of does like almost make it easier. Or like it doesn't just play with it. And like, there's no one way, but kind of just learning more about your body and the wall and like, how can they communicate together? Yeah. Cool. That's great. Okay. So the other part of your style, the physical trait that defines your style that I wanted to talk about is your three finger drag. You and Sean are legends with this. So I'm going to read a, I'm going to read a listener question because this person asked exactly what my question was. This is from Balil, Bilal, Bilal. Sorry, Bilal. Um, Okay. Brooke's three finger drag is kind of legendary. How did that happen? Did she train specifically for it or did it just always feel natural? And for context for people, I mean, you and Sean both have this, like you're, you're kind of known for it. And I just watched, um, I think I was on your Instagram or maybe it was in one of the videos I saw, but you're just like cranking out one arm pull-ups, like three finger dragging the center edge of the beast maker. And I'm like, God damn, that's so impressive. But, um, it really does seem like the two of you that kind of defines you're, you're, you're like, you're known for this open hand style. And that kind of defines like your entire climbing style because you have to move differently around holds if you're dragging versus, you know, close crimping and pulling in. Um, but yeah, where did that come from? Was that, do you think that's a nature or nurture thing? Um, it's funny that you call it, yeah, you call it like that Sean and I, you know, are known for that because actually in our world or at least in Boulder, it's called the ABC drag. Oh, the ABC <laughs> drag. Okay. Yeah. So it's like all the kids that, you know, ABC through like Colin, Colin is a big three finger dragger as well. I think it is a lot of, um, kids that start at a young age, just like, you know, they're just climbing and it's just like this. They don't even think about just paddling with their hands. Yeah. Yeah. Just don't even think about like the full crimping versus a lot of adults that start climbing. It's like, you know, really both for like finger health as well, that starting younger, those like tendons kind of learn. Um, it's just less, I think like for a lot of people, they're afraid to do three finger drag because of tendons versus like, I just grew up climbing where I'm to me, that's so normal. It's actually like easier. Like you said, like three finger on the middle beast maker to do a one arm. It's easier for me than four fingers. Mm. It's not that I'm like do you know, it's like, that's how I can, I mean, and now I can do both because I'm actually more so training four fingers and full crimp to get like that full range potential. Um, But I think it's just, yeah, kind of like how, grew up climbing and probably also has to do with height as well of like, you know, it gives you more reach three fingers. Yeah. Three to three, like versus four to four, like that's probably a good two inches on the tent. (laughs) Um, so like when, you know, you have to dead point to a hold, that's just a lot further for you. Like being able to catch it here versus here is pretty big difference in height. And then being comfortable, just like pulling on that, especially when like the moves weren't at my physical limit of finger strength comparative speaking, like the, what was hard for me wasn't the finger strength. So I never feel like I needed that like full grit of for, you know, full crimp that now I'm learning like, okay, to send maybe some of the out- hardest outdoor climbs, like I'm, I'm 
very much might need that like full crimp. Um, and some I don't, it really is dependent, but, um, yeah, I would say probably just growing up is, is how I learned. It's no way was I like, I'm going to train three finger drag as like a six year old. I mean, I didn't train <laughs> until I was like probably 20, honestly, mm. <laughs> just climbed. Yeah. <laughs> Do you do you train it now? Like now that you do spend more time on the hangboard and you're working on these other grips, full crimp and you know four finger half crimp and things, do you continue to train your drag, or do you feel like that's like your kind of superpower? Um, I wouldn't say I don't train it, but I, I mean, I do it every day. Like I use a hangboard now also just to warm up, mostly just for finger health. Like I kind of just go through like all the different motions and different positions so that like my fingers are warmed up and like, I just like to be able to feel confident on any finger. Like now I do like two fingers like this, like this, like Front two, even yeah, sometimes yeah. one fingers mm -hmm. so that like, if I were to ever catch a hold in any position or even, yeah, like if a climb is made that way, I'm like, I feel confident that like I could push as hard as I can with this and like, I'm not going to injure myself. Um, so yeah, I would say, I mean, yeah, I do it every day, but not necessarily for training more for, Warm up and injury prevention as well. Mm -hmm. Right on. I also think it might matter of pinky length. I don't yeah, know. yeah. I was gonna ask you. You seem <laughs> like you have. My pinkies are pretty low. Yeah, they're pretty short. You have short pinkies. Your pinky, your pinky comes. My mine comes like exactly to this knuckle on my ring finger. That's just mine's and under. Yeah, yours is below. Yeah. My fingers are also crooked. Fun fact. Oh wow! Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> have they always been that way yeah sean's are too <clears throat> and <our throat> grandpas are really crooked they're like i wonder if that like changes how you yeah you probably like grab holds differently than other people because of that yeah. <laughs> yeah. i love it <clears throat> let's talk about your coach i'm drawing a blank here chris danielson is that right yeah okay his yeah. reputation precedes him i don't know much about him i know that he's a very high level and respected and well-known uh, root setter and and sets yeah. roots at yeah, high so level competitions worked, like, and stuff. You know, he used to work with USA Climbing a lot, um, and a, yeah, been an IFSC route setter for a really long time. Um, obviously, not setting right now, but um, yeah, just a lot of knowledge in the climbing industry, competitions, growth of the sport, um, so much. And newer to coaching, I mean, he did he coached like Angie back in the day. Um, Angie Payne. Yeah, Angie Payne. Um, but yeah, he so he started coaching me, Colin and I actually for the Olympics in 2020. And then I continued on with him and have just we've like worked more and more together ever since then. But um yeah, he's just been a really pivotal point in my climbing of um especially like obviously with the physical components, but um even more so just like the overarching view of climbing as a lifetime sport. And like our goal is, you know, to be the best climber for as long as I can, um, which is just, I think such an important approach. And I'm so grateful to have someone in my life that like keeps reminding me of that because it's, it can be so easy to get sucked into those moments. And like when you have one goal, like short-term goal to just make it, you know, all encompassing, but, um, yeah, just always wanting to improve and not just improve weaknesses for, yeah, like one competition, one moment, but like, how can I be better as a person? How can I give more, um, through my climbing and just in general and balance like that? That's always been a thing for me. And like I said, from you know, my mom as well, grew up with that, um, of like, it doesn't matter how much you love climbing. It cannot be your everything, mm. you know? Yeah. We need other things going on. Um, and I think that was why school was so important too. For me is it's like when I was at school, you know, I was daydreaming about climbing. And when I was at climbing, I was daydreaming about school. But Were like, you? Like, yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> I, I mean, and sometimes I was you doing think both, about you know, psychology. Like, and, yeah, yeah. I'm like doing flashcards while on the moon board, like countless <laughs> amount of time, you know? or like That's having awesome. a podcast in my ear and a class in five minutes that I'm literally running out the door for. <laughs> like, it, it, if I could have, I should have done a vlog of my day at school because it was down to like the five second mark. <laughs> it was crazy. Um, mm. But yeah, just like having those other things to fuel and, and connect to of like 
because of the reason it worked so well is because I'd be in class and I'm like, wow, that's so cool that I can apply this like to my climbing and, you yeah. know, to my, what I want to like do in climbing. And then in climbing, I'm like, wow, like learning this and this like breath work before I get on the wall adds up to like, just like how our brains work, you know, through school. Like there's just so many things that connect. So it's not those, it's a balance and like everything being, I guess, har- harmonious, you mm. know, like a holistic approach, I think is really important. Um, so yeah, we worked a lot on that and just, yeah, I don't even know what I want to say, but um, yeah, I guess just like really, really grateful for that relationship and um, the ways that it's, it's pushed me to be better and like do this as a lifetime. Yeah. Sport. Like through that passion and like be happy while doing it. Not like it's easy. I feel like to be like, okay, like I'm just going to do this for a while. And then once this is over, I can like live my life, you know? And it's like, I don't want to do that. Like yeah. this is my life. Like I'm mm. living my life, you know, I don't want to be waiting to live my life. Um, yeah. So having a support system that has me, you know, helps me work through those hard moments and really be able to like talk about them and also be able to see the bigger picture of like, there's so much more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love all that. It, it, what, what all roles does, does Chris play for you? Like, is he also designing your training He's an amazing root setter. I'm imagining him, you know, hands-on, like setting specific boulders for you that work on things you want to work on. Is it all of that? Or is it more the like deeper life, like philosophy, mindset sort of stuff? Yeah, no, it's all, I mean, the daily stuff is mostly like, yeah, I mean, we plan like our training sessions together and like um, just like whole year view, even of like timeline, like, okay, right now is rest time. And then we'll get back into more strength training and like building phase um and then you know later on closer to the competition go more towards co- like competition climbs and even mock competitions stuff like that so planning those things and he has so many great connections um and like you know friends in the industry so like working with setters throughout boulder like that will help us like at movement for example like oh can you guys help us set a climb before she leaves for innsbruck you know that's world cup style because there aren't that many like climbs i mean there aren't hard enough like rope climbs around here at all for like training or that replica world cups um bouldering or lead so having to put those in places for me to think about is like so much of like Mm. i need to talk so having someone that does that and it's like okay we're going here we're doing a boulder lead simulation today um it's all planned you know that's cool yeah yeah and then yeah and then he of course makes up lots of climbs for me and knows my style really well so working on Areas of improvement, not weaknesses. <laughs> areas of improvement, not weaknesses. Love areas that. Areas to improve on, um, <laughs> as well as, you know, strengths and motivation. Uh, but we do most of our work on a spray wall. Uh, he now has a facility, which is really cool. So it's it's kind of like a cat style. Um, so we do a lot of stuff there. And his kid has a little playroom so we can play with him. And, yeah. Uh, a bunch of other friends. I think Will in. England was telling me about this. We were talking about the most epic spray walls in the country. And... Chris's spray wall definitely came up. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's newer, <laughs> but it's really, it's really awesome. And so that's been pretty super, super nice to um, just be able to go in there anytime, any day, you know, it's not like crowded, but if we want people to come, we have friends that we invite, um, have projects and also just make stuff up. So mostly just making up boulders and climbing um, and then planning, you know, other other stuff around that so climbing he does like you know the physical climbing and then a lot of the behind the scenes planning and then also just like kind of life life mentor which i'm really really grateful that's for. awesome that's awesome that, that's what you want in a coach it sounds like you lucked out it sounds perfect yeah for sure <laughs> <laughs> i love that um do you ever a lot of people so okay so I, I reached out to my patrons i reached out to people on instagram i have a ton of questions for you so i think we're going to wrap up this main episode pretty soon and dive into um, an extra segment and dive into some questions. Um, But a lot of them, I want to ask this before we kind of wrap up this main segment here. A lot of people want to know how you've been able to balance such high level competition climbing with such high level outdoor climbing at the same time. And I'm curious if you ever actually 
train for outdoor climbing in particular, or if all of the preparation for World Cups and competitions is so arduous and makes you such a good climber that you can easily, I don't want to say easily, but readily apply that on the rock because rock climbing is simply less complicated than what you guys do now in competitions. I'm curious which it is, but if you're, if you're getting ready for a trip to Switzerland or, you know, getting ready to try box therapy or something like that, are you working with Chris on specific skills or moves or styles for outdoor climbing projects? Or is it, are you able to just rock climb as hard as you do because you've been rock climbing since you were two years old and, and now you've built this like incredible, um, physicality and athleticism on top of it with all of your competition training? Yeah. Um, I'd say both, like definitely, I mean, there was never a time when I like stopped outdoor climbing, like, you know, or competing. So I've always have balanced both. Um, and I think like a lot of my strength as well is in competition is able like to be applied to outdoors. It's like most of my training yeah, it's helping outdoors. And I really believe that outdoor climbing helps competition. Like I'm an advocate for that. And also like really grateful that, yeah, Chris, you know, he wants me to go outside as much as I can, as much as I like, whenever I want to, it's like, yeah, you should go outside. Of course. Like, I mean, maybe right leading up to a competition, like not going outside every day. Um, but if like this day, I'm, luckily I live in Boulder, like want to go up to Boulder Canyon, like it's only going to help me. Um, can you, can you expand on that? I don't, yeah, don't, don't lose your train of thought. Sorry to interrupt, but, um, but in what ways does the outdoor climbing feed back into competition climbing? I think it's just like for, I mean, two parts. One, it's just overall, you know, strength. Like if having more strength and power as a climber translates to being a better climber, like sure. It could be a time thing of, you know, is it better to spend time on coordination moves or like strength climbing? Um, you know, like pure, what we call outdoor style. Um, but yeah, I think climbing outside only makes you stronger. Um, for me, it makes me feel stronger, like fingers, full body, and just like the willingness to try hard on like hard climbs. Um, and then there's like definitely just the joy component of like refresh, like mm. I think that's so important. And so that's why it's, it doesn't work for everyone. Like, you know, I know a lot of competition climbers that just don't like climbing outside, which to me is mind blowing. Um, like, but you know, that's, they yeah. shouldn't do what they don't love. Right. Um, just, you know, my brother doesn't love competitions. He shouldn't do competitions. Like if he wants to outdoor climb only. Um, but yeah, so it's like a refresh for me, like whether it's a, you know, the week, but even if it's the week before, if it's like, it can be a lot to just be in the gym training and just even one day out where it's like, Oh my God, breathing the fresh air and just climbing on rock, whether I'm failing or succeeding just feels like good and feels right to me. So like, why wouldn't I do it? Versus I think a lot of people, and especially in the past, it's, it seems like you're taking away from your what like training where like, Oh, I, no one else is climbing outside. So I should be climbing inside. Um, I have definitely felt like that in the past where it's like, or going on trips, like I'm on like a month long trip in Switzerland. Nobody else in the world cup circuit is doing that. You know, mm -hmm. they're in the training. Like that's like, I feel like I shouldn't be doing that. So I'm really grateful to have like, you know, both Sean, my, pa like my parents and Chris, who's like, that's just not true. You know, you're doing you and, and that's great. And like, yeah, I feel like I'm learning in different ways on the rock that I can then apply um, to competition. But also more than that, it's it's just like I'm enjoying that. Like I'm going to do that because that's another another side of me. Um, yeah. Did that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> <Kinda. laughs> yeah. Very cool. Um, when you do and train specifically for rock climbs, what does that look like? Um. Yeah, I would say I haven't spent too much time training for like specific rock climbs. Um, that makes me so excited for what you are going to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty sick. Like imagine if you spent like a year training for a V17 or something. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm psyched to do that one day. I will, Hell for yeah. sure. Um, <laughs> but I would say that most of my training does revolve around that like base level, like strength power outdoor climbing in a way like i do so much spray wall climbing so um 
And then I add on, like when I get closer to competitions, more competition style, like, you know, the slabs, the coordination, the jumps, the mock comps, stuff like that. So that's more what I add on versus like year round, I'm doing the, the strength power, um, kind of full body yeah. stuff. So, yeah. So I would say like my, almost in a way, my main focus is the simplicity of just climbing. Mm. Um, and like that relates really well to both outdoor and like hard gym climbing and where board, almost board style. Um, and then I add on the competition component. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I wouldn't, but if I'm going to like go on a trip and stuff like that, definitely fingers like in the competition season, I'm always like, God, I feel like my fingers are weak because I don't spend as much time, like either just like hangboarding. Like I like to do max weighted hangs, um, or like I used to do a lot of one on hangs. I don't quite as much anymore. Um, but yeah, training fingers and like, or board climbing as well. So once I get closer to competitions, I do less of, I do less of that probably just not even because it's not helpful just because of time. I don't have time to do it all. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. You, you get more specific and have to strip away the, the the other stuff. Yeah. 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 So, but most for the most part, my base is always going to be, um, you know, just trying to get stronger and more powerful. That relates to both. Why have you shifted from one arm hangs towards weighted two arm hangs? That's what I'm hearing. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Um, I I guess talking with more professionals in the field as well, like Eric Hurst. Um, is, you know, given some, he's really knowledgeable in that field of like more testing and stuff with different trainings. Um, so I kind of switched to max weighted hang to like two hands. Uh, but it's not necessarily because one works better than the other. It was like, I just was like, oh, I'm ready to switch it up. Mm. Um, which honestly, I'll probably do again this year. I, I think change is important. And um, even though I'm a creature of habit, I believe change is important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so that was kind of just more of my shift. It wasn't necessarily because it's better, but I think just like loading the fingers because like, but this, I mean, I want to just disclaimer, like only if your fingers are healthy. Like I think a lot of hangboard should be used for injury prevention as well instead of just gaining strength, especially at a level, um, a newer level. Like I think a lot of people get injured hangboarding because they are like, I need to train fingers when it's like, you do not need to train fingers yet. You need time climbing. And like the hangboard is a great tool to, you know, for your fingers to learn what this feels like, what like just even just hanging body weight on like a certain edge feels like so that it's prepared. Totally. Um, but yeah, I kind of like to switch it up, but I've just, I have found kind of a routine that makes me feel good. Um, and so right now that involves weighted hangs, max weighted hangs. Um, yeah, maybe next week we'll switch it up. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Um, you mentioned areas of improvement, things that you're working on. I would love to hear as you think about May and the coming competition season, um, what are you working on in particular to get ready for the competitions and to go after that last qualifying spot for Paris? And um, and just beyond that, like, what are you? what's next for you and what are you excited about? Um, yeah, I would say, I mean, I think just continuously, you know, trusting the process and, um, I believe everything I'm like been doing this past few years has been working really well. So I want to continue doing that, not like switch things up. Um, but yeah, I would say like areas to improve on have definitely been like jumps and leg power, um, which I worked quite a bit on last year. And I think I saw some improvements. It's hard in competition to be like, you know, you never get the same climb again. So like, how much are you really improving? But I really, I do believe that I improved on that. So I'm going to work more on that coordination as well. Um, and yeah, mental game. I think just like being comfortable in those high pressure situations and um, not only comfortable, but using them to my advantage. All right. That's awesome. I've so enjoyed talking to you by the way. <laughs> yeah, <me too>. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <you're>, <laughs> it's funny. I, I've i um, obviously followed your climbing for a long time. Um, I watched the Louder Than 11 documentary that they did on your World Cup journey um, this morning, actually. That was one of the final things that I watched in prep, and I'm really glad I found it. Um, but that was the first time I'd really heard you speak much. Like, 
I don't know if you're a, a, a quiet person or if it's just <laughs> random, like maybe it's just the way in which um, you've been filmed or whatever, but I didn't really know what to expect. This is the first time that you and I have ever talked and you're very easy to talk to. You're very smart. You're very thoughtful and very open. Like you feel very present and just open and real. And I really appreciate that. It's, it's really, um, it makes my job easy and it makes my job very fun. But beyond that, it's just a real gift for everyone listening that you showed up here today as yourself willing to talk about um, anything I asked you about. And I know, you know, it's, 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 it can be a little bit more challenging sometimes to do this with um, professional and higher profile climbers because you guys have your personal brand, like there's kind of stakes, right? And, and I respect that. And, um, but yeah, I, I just, I just really appreciate it. I appreciate the way you showed up today and the way you hold yourself and the way you think about things. And it sounds like you have a very pure joy and love for climbing. And it sounds like that's going to continue for a long, long time. So we're all rooting for you for Paris. We're all very excited for you. And we're excited to see what you do outdoors as well. I think some crazy things are going to happen. Stoked for that. And we're going to dig into all that. We're going to dig into some more questions. I've got a bunch of questions for you from patrons and from um, people that I reached out to on Instagram. So patrons stick around. We're going to do an extra. Um, Brooke, is there anything else that you want to touch on before I let you go? Yeah, no, I think that was really great. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, I don't do many of these podcasts anymore. Like you said, I feel like I'm so, you know, busy and it is, it's, you know, fine line of not, I mean, I'm always open to share, but more like publicly media. It's like, I spend more time sharing with my friends and family and people that I talk to in person. So, but I think it's really important to give back. And like, I, you know, I'm just excited for more people to enjoy the sport and like, find that love and passion. So I hope to be able to spread my own and help people find it. And that's kind of my goal. So thanks for helping me share that. Beautiful. My, my pleasure. I'm honored to have you here. Yeah. All right. Thanks to everyone for listening. Hope you enjoyed that again, patrons stick around and for everyone else, we will see you next time. All right. This question is from Andre. I love this question. First of all, Brooke is an amazing and super inspiring climber to watch. If Brooke had to train her brother for two to three months, what would be one thing she would absolutely have him work on? Well, that's a good one. Um, I would tell him to suck it up and not complain about a skin. <laughs> <laughs> which I should probably say about myself as well. So when we're together, we complain a lot about our skin. Um, <laughs> and I mean, I don't know. It's hard to say. Cause I think in my, like, I want to say there's, you know, a lot of things I think he can improve on, improve on, which I think is true. But I also think a lot of the reason he is where he is, is just cause he does what he wants. And that's pretty incredible. And um, it's like, what he, you know, what he wants to do is also very different than what I want to do and that a lot of other people want to do and just like their approach. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like at the same time, I can't say much because I wouldn't ever want to take away from what he like does because it's, it's pretty incredible and mm. it works really well because he knows himself so well. Yeah. Do you think there's anything that he would say if I asked him that uh, question about you? He'd probably tell me to like chill out. I don't know. Like, do <laughs> Sean would tell you to chill out. I don't, I've, I've, do you know that I met? I met Sean um, at a thrift shop in Boulder like a month oh, yeah, ago. Not that long ago. Yeah. <laughs> He's very yeah. chill. He was very friendly, very wonderful yeah. to talk to. But yeah, he is so I'm chill. Like, so he probably would tell you to chill out. He'd probably tell, tell everyone to, to like, chill out. To do a little bit more, and he'd tell me to chill out. But do more? <laughs> is that what you said? I would tell him to be like, like it's okay to like, you know try a little hard like, oh, okay like when you i guess he's just always like i don't feel good i'm, gonna, I'm not you would push you know, he like, would he would chill i'd be like push and he'd be like chill out <laughs> <laughs> yeah good balance between the two of you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's great um let's see here what's next okay a couple people uh, i'll ask this quick one here. This is from Keith. Um, do Brooke's braids ever interfere with her climbing? She almost always flicks her braids behind her head before climbing. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, yeah. I don't notice it. It's just like habit that I flick them. Mm -hmm. But um, like speed climbing, I could not speed climb with braids. 
which was a big thing because I actually wore braids for the Olympics. And then all of a sudden, like I've, I've sped, I've sped, sped climbed. I, I like speak English <laughs> all of a sudden. <laughs> I've sped climbed with braids before, but then all of a sudden, like at the Olympics in our practice qualifier, I was like, there was one braid here and one in the back. And the entire time I was like, oh my God, I don't want this here. I was like, get, get out, get out. <laughs> so then I put it in a braid or in a bun um, for the, the actual qualifier. Um, and same with lead. I don't like it. Cause I feel like I don't have as much control if I can move them, which probably means they are in my way, but I like them. So mm-hmm. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> this is from Yenin. As a shorter climber, how does she do it? I mean, we all say height is a, height is not a factor, but often it is. So question one, how does brain, how does Brooke train <laughs> to address height disadvantages? And two, has she ever wished she was taller? Definitely wished I was taller before. Um, but at the end of the day, it's like, I can't control how tall I am. <laughs> that's for sure. And I, you know, can't control what the setters set. If it feels morpho or is morpho, um, for those that don't know, morpho usually just means height dependent. And that can be for short or tall climbers. Um, but yeah, so I try to just focus on like, what can I control? And it's just, to me, it's getting stronger and better and that will help with my height difference. Like I can never actually control that height difference, but I think also I have a lot of strengths because of my height um, and things I've learned as being like from being a shorter climber. Um, so yeah, for me, I mean, I definitely, I'm not going to say I don't complain because I complain um, sometimes about being short, but for the most part, it's just like, I can't change that. So um, do with, you know, do what you can with what you got. And yeah, uh, yeah, just, I, I think I can always, I always have room to improve and height aside and that will help with height difference. So. Yeah. I think, I, I I mean, this comes up a lot. I think with height, it's always so helpful to just zoom out and look at climbing. Like look who, look at who is doing hard stuff and man, it is one hell of a spectrum. You have people who are like six, yeah. three and jacked and like, you know, 190 pounds and you have yeah. people who are five foot or shorter doing really hard stuff. They're they're maybe not doing the same hard things, yeah. um, but maybe they are, and that's sick. But like, there's so many ways to express um, your skills and your strengths in climbing at a really high level. And you know, maybe it's just a matter of like picking a different project or something um, if you're getting frustrated. Yeah, exactly. I think it's like, it can be really easy to get, you know, sucked into the like, oh, this is harder for me because I'm shorter. But then- I feel like if you're, if I'm able to zoom out, like when I'm climbing, you know, let's say alone with my coach, like sure, this move might actually be harder because I'm shorter, but I wouldn't even realize because I'm not climbing with a taller person. Mm. So when a taller person's there, like that's not taking away from me and like this moment, like climbing on this climb and learning, like if it's hard for me, it's going to feel that much better to do, you know, Mm -hmm. like right now, you know, I'm, there's a a project I have and it's like definitely not that if you compare like grade wise to, um, different like or style like style and grade like might not be my best climb to pick for my style right like it's really hard for me is what i'm trying to say um (laughs) versus like box therapy where it's like it fit me so well that it didn't feel like that extreme versus like a really tall person it might feel harder like like you said you know if you're like six three and 190 pounds like it would feel very different but kind of viewing that as like this is a challenge for myself. It doesn't take away that it's might be easier for someone else that has a height advantage. Like yeah. this might be easier for myself, but that doesn't mean like, I feel like no, I don't even want to name people, but there's <laughs> a lot of people that inspire me on both spectrums of like mm. pushing themselves on a style that isn't theirs. Like that's just cool. And that's like inherently feels good to work on something that is hard for you, despite it maybe being harder for you than others. Yeah, totally. Love that. Yeah. yeah that, like, that's a cool yeah. perspective how I try to view it. And like I said, I mean, I, I, it's not like I have that like great perspective every day. Sometimes I'm like, this sucks. I wish I was taller. Right. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I think I, I, I try and view it as that of like, yeah, you, you get what you get. And like, it's, if this is harder then so be it, that's cool. It's it, Let's do it anyways. Nice. What, uh, what is your project? I have to ask, are you willing to say this yeah. will, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I've been, I'm just been, no one's going to be listening to this. It's fine. It's just you and me. Um, I've been trying the game in Boulder. Fuck yeah. That's so game. sick. So I'm yeah. super psyched on that. 
Um, it's kind of hard to like been trying it for a little while now, but also not. It's like every like six months. So I feel like I reset and I have to like try again because weather and just like traveling, but um, I'm really psyched on it. It's like one of my biggest dream, dream climbs. And that's so sick. Hard for me. So what, what makes it hard for you? Is it like the compression style? I don't really, I don't, I don't know if uh, I mean, it's be... really, really just like pure power climb, mm-hmm. which is so cool. But the first move is really big, which isn't actually too much of a problem. Like if I, like, cause I can reach it. It's like, if you can't reach it, it'd be, you'd be done. But since you can, it's not that much harder. But then the next move, like I'm so extended. I have to move, you get this like foot lock and then move the foot up. And I just have no space between like me and the wall essentially to like move. So it feels like really stuck versus someone, you know, who might have more height. Like they just have a lot more yeah. space. To do with. So that, um, yeah. And I mean, it's just pure, pure power, which is really sick. So um, it's just, I think it's a really benchmark hard climb and um, it's one I've, you know, I've grown up in Boulder. So it's a big, big dream of mine for sure. Yeah. Love it. That's awesome. Okay. That, that leads us into this. So this is another hard hitting topic. Okay. Potentially, maybe not. I don't know. Um, but a lot of people wanted to know about box therapy and downgrading it, of course. And so I just want to, I want to kind of set the stage for this because um, I just want to say you accomplished an amazing thing. Katie accomplished an amazing thing. You each expressing your own opinions on the grade doesn't take away from anyone else. Like, it's just annoying that we even have to say that. But like, I, I hate that. Um, I'm wondering if you experienced backlash with this when you made that post, because, um, you know, automatically people on the internet just want to be so annoying and they want to say like, Oh, are you taking away from, and it's like, of course not, dude. Like these two people just both did a badass rock climb and they just thought it was a different opinion. grade and, and they had a different opinion, but I did get some good questions about it. So this one is from Kasavin and Kasavin wanted to know. Um, how difficult was the thought process leading up to a suggestion of a grade or a downgrade for box therapy? Um, did you and Katie or any other ascensionists discuss it before you posted it? Um, yeah. 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 That was a little question. Yeah. This, yeah, this, I agree. It's, it's frustrating. That, People like, want to like pit you against each other and it's like, just yeah. don't do that. So, Katie and I are really good friends and like both, I feel like very chill. <laughs> so with us, there's no problem. Um, yeah, we, I, I reached out to her beforehand before I posted, like, also I was really, like I said, I'm a people pleaser. Like I was really nervous about it beforehand. Um, which did kind of honestly take away a little bit as well from the send, like Mm. knowing that it didn't matter what I did. It would kind of, there was some backlash and just from the outside public who are not involved, but I just knew there would be, um, was, and there was, yeah, I mean, I would just say mostly on Instagram, just like yeah. annoying comments and stuff, Trolls. like not actual bash, backlash. Like every one of my, you know, personal conversations and relationships are like, it was great, very positive, um, just from people that have no idea what's going on. And like, I was called a misogynist. So that was really fun. <laughs> like, you're yeah, anti women like, now. God damn I'm it. I'm anti woman from a man. I was like, oh, oh <laughs> from a man, of course. Go there. It was wild. <laughs> but, um, it's just frustrating that like, why is this a thing? Like, yeah, yeah it, was, it was frustrating. And in no way would I ever, my goal was never to take away um, from Katie, like her, you know, first female ascent of box therapy was incredible and inspired me, you know, to go back up there. Um, and yeah, and her opinion's her opinion. And, but for me, it was, so I first tried, I'll kind of start at the beginning, but I first tried box therapy September, 2022 went up one day with my brother because he was trying it and I did every move pretty fast and I fell on the stand my first day which is an 11 so like from the bottom I fell on the stand and then I did the stand so like did really well on the climb two overlapping parts yeah and also even before that Sean before we even went up there Sean was like oh yeah, I'm thinking of maybe calling it like if I, you know, he gets a little bit ahead of himself he hasn't done it but (laughs) I think I might call it like um, 8C and then we get up there and, you know, he's still not doing it. And he was like, oh, maybe it is 16. There's the hike, whatever, whatever. Um, and I do really well. I do, and I was like, wow, that's crazy. You know, I'm like psyched, but I'm like, what? that doesn't, to me personally, I've never even tried a V16. I have tried V15. So like the game, for example, was kind of what I was comparing it to. And um, what else have I tried? It's not that many V15s, but even just like seeing them in Red Rocks and stuff like that. Um, 
and it, it was like completely my style, but I was just like really surprised at how I felt on it. And after that, like day, I was like, to me, I can't imagine calling that V16 for myself. Um, it didn't like on that first day, even like it felt better than, for example, your, the climb I did in Ticino. Um, that's like an AP plus, which I find like a really hard AP plus. Um, yeah. So just comparing it to different things and stuff, it like after that day, I had said to friends and everything that I was like really psyched. I was like, yeah, I did really well. Like, I'd love to go back. Like, I don't know. It doesn't really feel V16 to me because that just in my mind also is kind of crazy. But then again, grades are like so subjective and wild that something like does genuinely feel so different for so many different people that how can like, how can someone be wrong? You know, right. <laughs> like this is how I feel. Like you're not wrong. Okay. That's how you feel. This is how I feel. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's okay to have like different opinions on grades personally. And I also think, I mean, we could go on forever about grades and I don't want to, but <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> I kinda, like, I don't want to, cause there's no, there's no perfect solution. No, I know. Uh, yeah. I'll just yeah. rant about it too. Yeah. If we, if yeah. we get going, cause it is like, I, I will rant about it for a second and then I'll stop. <laughs> <Go for it. laughs> but like one thing that is really frustrating to me is that anytime something gets downgraded, there's this kind of, at least online, you know, broad um, sentiment that like, oh, that is the grade now. One person gives it a lower grade than it's been given before. And all of a sudden it's that now, you know? And it's like- Well, and people also for sorry, I cut you off. No, but. it's it's fine. Yeah, but it just that just doesn't make sense. You know, like it's it should yeah. be a spectrum. It, different sizes, different people, different styles are gonna have different opinions. That just makes sense. Like we're all interacting with a piece of rock and we're all different. So it's going to feel different. Climb up like the hardest way possible. Like it's all inherently like, like what are we doing? Which is awesome. You know, but like, how can we, yeah, Yeah. it's just wild. But, um, so that's just how I felt from day one. So for me, it actually wasn't that hard of a decision of what I was going to grade it. Like that question. Cause from day one, I, I was like, I believe this is eight C. Um, and then Katie did it. I was super psyched for her. And, kind of immediately I was like like I I had already I was planning you know to go back up but I it was another year until I went back um I wish I got to try it with her that would have been really fun mm. um, we got to climb like in the park together in 2020 during COVID a lot and it was so much fun she's like oh my god she's so strong her fingers are like insane um but we haven't climbed together in a while so it would have been really cool um but yeah anyways went back and um did it almost did it this or like kind of yeah it was a year later so reacquainted myself and like fell on the stand a few more times and then did it the next time like second try with my brother back to back which was just insane That's so sick. um and i kind of knew i was like <laughs> wow you know i was like oh like i i just know that if i do it i i'm gonna call it eight c because i that felt wrong and like for me it felt i yeah it felt really weird. It was a really weird situation where I was like, I in no way want to take anything away from Katie. I also know there's going to be backlash online because people, first of all, don't know the full story and just always have an opinion when they don't need to, <laughs> when they're not involved. Um, but I was like, morally, like if I believe that it's 8C and have this entire time, I cannot call it 8C plus. Like I want to do an 8C plus one day. I want to send V16 and this to be, I didn't, I haven't, you know, um, to both to myself and just like, you know, the rock climb itself. It did, it's like, this is what I believe. I, I feel like I need to share my honest opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was frustrating that my honest opinion, you know, like was just an opinion. And um, yeah, I, I guess that's all I can say on that, that um, it was a really weird position to be in, but um, I overall, I'm happy with how I handled it. I was never questioned like what I was going to grade it. And I just wanted to make sure that I kind of did it the right way. And that meant like, yeah, reaching out to Katie beforehand. And I talked to Daniel as well, who, um, said he, in the end, like, you know, when you set, when you are the first to do a climb, put an FA up and like set a grade or like a prop, it's a proposition, a, you know, proposal for the grade. Yeah. Uh, so it's the same as you said, like one person downgrades it, like that's one person, one person puts it up. Like they're asking for more people to do the climb and get more consensus around the climb. So, and he believed like, he was like, I also believe it's eight C after like more time and doing other climbs and, um, 
you know, different beta comes about and stuff like that. He did it when it was like snow everywhere, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, he agreed with me. I talked, yeah, I talked to obviously Sean. So a lot of communication internally. And uh, as much as like, it, I kind of wanted to share that on the internet of like people, like I've, you know, been talking like this, you can't tell the whole story if, mm-hmm. even if you try. So I just figured I'd keep it simple. And some people were upset and said, I, you know, I was taking away Katie's FFA and whatever, which is just not true. Like she, you know, she did the climb and she shared her opinion. And it was insanely badass and like six, she was the first climber to do it. Um, and I'm yeah, grateful to follow in her footsteps and share my own opinion. <laughs> yeah. I love it. No, thanks for speaking. Thanks for speaking to all that. And it says a lot about your character and how conscientious you are that you even reached out and talked to her about it, you know? Um, cause you didn't have to like, you know, and, and um, you could have just blindsided her with that or, or whatever. But, um, yeah. but yeah, yeah you, to me you, it was more like, sorry. Well, uh, you so, like, you so clearly like weren't doing it to prove a point or, you know, like it's just none yeah. of that energy that people project onto it was there. It's just, it's just annoying people on the internet. Yeah. Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> it was like, I just, I didn't even want to post about it. Like, honestly, mm. like, I mean, it took me a week too, because I was like, I'm happy with the climb, but like what sucks that it, this is taking away from just like the joy of the moment and like everything because it's going to cause drama for no reason when there's no actually no drama yeah but uh, as much as like you know sean's good at not posting about stuff like that and like i want to <laughs> not it was already out too like people mm. already knew and were saying things and so i was like i feel like it's just better if i just i tried to just do it clean and simple and i spent a lot of time on my response as well like you know trying um uh, yeah to word it well but you can't please everyone so that's yeah. what i'm learning uh, you, d- dude <laughs> you and me both man yeah that's that's a hard lesson that's a lesson um, that's hard to learn and uncomfortable to learn, but so important and um, so helpful. So helpful yeah, to have but that overall, I mean, overall, it's all, it's good. It's, you know, water under the bridge. And I'm, I'm definitely happy with how I handled the situation, even though there's uncomfortable parts of it. Yeah. Sure. Awesome. Okay. Let's do a handful of rapid fire. These are just quick and then we'll, we'll be done. This is from JK. Um, would you ever start a YouTube channel? There's a lot of male pro climber YouTubers but would love to see more females in the mix. That's a good question. There are a lot of male YouTubers. Um, I guess maybe eventually right now, absolutely not. I feel like I do so much and social media like takes up a lot of, I I just don't really like spending time on social media. I like having a platform to share and like inspire. And like, I've gotten a lot of incredible responses Um and just like inspiring stories of, you know, people being inspired by me, which is pretty crazy to think that like, I have that, um, ability, I guess. And like that, yeah, that wide of a platform that it's like, I, yeah, I want to use it to spread positivity and also just like real realistic positivity. Mm. Um, but I just don't have the time or energy to like put my whole life online right now, nor do I want to like first, first serve is what's, you know, in around me and my actual eyes and view um so yeah not right now but maybe in the future we'll see okay <laughs> i'm voting for more guest appearances on sean's channel you guys should just do m- more more uh, moonboard sessions together that was yeah. super fun yeah we probably will yeah yeah go follow him <laughs> he's doing pretty well <laughs> yeah, I thought that was a blast i love that um this is from raj outside will we ever get a video of sean of you and sean sending box therapy back to back i believe so all right. Yeah. Hell yes. Um, Consider us teased. Yeah. Look out on Mellow. We'll see. Okay. Yeah. Open for soon. This is from Oscar.brew. <laughs> do, do you ever feel like you are in the shadow of your brother or vice versa? Um, I definitely don't feel like I'm in the shadow of my brother. I hope Sean doesn't feel like he's in my shadow. Um, I feel like maybe you know, a couple of years ago, like when I was getting bigger on the comp scene and stuff. And he is still like, I mean, anyone who knew who he was and like, is actually in the outdoor climbing world, like knew how incredible he was. But before he kind of blew up from a, like, I guess media wise or like outside view, he possibly felt like that for sure. So I definitely hope not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I think it's pretty special that we, like you said at the beginning, we have our niches and you have your lanes. It's, it's awesome. Yeah, we have our lanes and like we, you know, I'll do anything to support him and like uh share, you know, his story and 
like I said, we're so different, but we get along so well, which is really cool. Like we push each other in very good ways. So there'll be a lot more collaborations to come. And, um, but also a lot of individual, like, you know, he's doing some incredible stuff on his own that I'm psyched to support and me as well. So very cool. Very cool. Yeah. You guys seem like you have a very collaborative, supportive relationship. It's, I feel that from the outside. It seems like it's nothing but love and support for one another. Yeah. That's no, cool. Definitely. Like, I mean, any competition is just like, it's very open and like, I want to, you know, do this before you. But like, <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> love that. Who sent box first? Sean did. God damn it. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was pretty great. He was like, He'll he didn't look time. like it was going that well. Um, and then I just pulled it out and like, I had fallen on like the last move. Like it was first. I mean, we both did it really fast that day. It was like second or third try, I think. And then he did it and we were like, whoa. And then literally next try, I like, I almost wish we kept the cameras. We didn't keep the cameras <laughs> rolling, but like probably five minutes later. Wow. Like, it was <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That's awesome. Uh, this is from Jake, not climbs. Are there any V 16s you're eyeing up or V 17s? Um, no, not really. Just, you know, hard, like hard climbs in front of me, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, when I was in Switzerland, I mean, I feel like it's so funny climbing with my brother. Cause like, I probably tried like three V17s in three days because we were just in the Alfin cave because it was raining so much. Mm. Um, and that's like the only climb you could get on. And that was really cool to, um, to do moves on and like, yeah, actually do moves on. I'm like, holy you know, I'm doing moves on a V17. That's pretty cool. No, I'll try to climb. Um, so yes and no, like I'm down to try them. Um, but no real plans right now. That'd be so sick. If you did Alphane, that would be amazing. <laughs> Secretly hoping yeah. for that eventually, but you got, you got bigger fish to fry in the near future. Um, this is from FX, uh, favorite book. Hmm. Question. Um, uh, a few, uh, mostly in the psychology realm, but um, I was reading The Power of Now, which I really like. Mm. Um, it's just all about like the power of now. I mean, the title speaks for itself, but being present in the moment and using that to better yourself and like really kind of be in touch with this crazy world we live in, um, which I thought was really cool. And to be able to apply both to climbing and just to, you know, life in general. Um, and then I just read the Zen of climbing, which is a book by Francois something. I think um, Josh champion talked about this in our episode. Yeah. I'll find it for people. It's a newer book. And I, it's um, a really pretty book. It kind of looks like a, like a Bible or something, right? Yeah. It's like blue and has just like a pretty like climber, like outlined in white. It's really pretty. I just randomly picked it up. Hadn't heard anything about it. Like I was at the Boulder bookstore, which I love. And, um, yeah, it was really good read. It was cool because it kind of felt, I mean, like I said, I was doing, I've been doing a lot of independent research, haven't been doing as much recently, but, um, and a lot of the work that, you know, I was writing and just like all my thoughts was like that. So it was really cool to read that. And it feels like all the psychology books that I've read and then relate to climbing in my mind, you know, and this was like already it's related to climbing. So that was cool. Um, and there was, it was really funny while I was reading it, all of a sudden I had like, it said my name in the book. <laughs> I was like, oh. like your full name, Brooke Rabbit too. <laughs> like I got a little shout out. And that That's was awesome. Crazy. And I just like randomly picked this book up. Like in no way I was like, you know, <laughs> that was really funny. Oh, to be um, an Olympian. Shout That's out, awesome. Shout out too. So that was funny. But um, yeah, I really enjoyed reading that and just like, you know, thinking about it. But I like books that make me. I wonder if the author ever thought you would pick it up and, and stumble <laughs> into it like that. That's got to be fun for. Yeah, I don't know. It was yeah. really funny. I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, a few more and then we're done. Um, if you could live anywhere for bouldering, where would it be? Um, definitely, I mean, Ticino. Uh, I mean, I feel like I have to say Boulder. Boulder's pretty insane and i just love living in boulder but that's awesome Ticino's, Ticino's incredible for just like oh my god the patent like there's so many rock climbs so many like i said i got on like three v17s you know in one day and there's like so many unfound boulders like the hard potential out there is never ending um but i don't think i personally would want to live there for that long um i like shorter times so probably boulder all right Living the dream. Um, this is, go ahead. 
It just said you could climb full season in Boulder too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Um, this is from Austin Hoyt, who's been on the show. He's very good climber, climb V15. Uh, he yeah. just wrote gunks with a question mark. <laughs> he's passionate about the gunks. He wants to know if you're ever going to come to the gunks. That's what he's asking. I'm down. Yeah, I'm down <laughs> for sure. <laughs> don't have much. Yeah, don't have much plan for it, but um, I'll put it on my put it on my my list. All right. There we go. Um, how long, this is from Sterner Products. How long before we see the first female V17 ascent and which V17 does Brooke think it will be? Ask me to predict the future. Yep. I have no idea. I think probably not that long in like in that long. Doesn't um, seem like it. And well, we'll see. I don't know. Okay. You don't have an opinion on which one seems the most, I don't know, fitting for a shorter climber or et cetera? Uh, I don't know. I definitely like to try Burden of Dreams, so we'll see. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I got to get time to fly out there. Sick. And I think they're, I mean, I've, I guess I've tried a lot because being with Sean, which is really cool that like, yeah, these experiences is something I wouldn't I feel like I wouldn't go out of my way to try V17 right now, but like I probably would have said that about, you know, V16, 15, probably not V14 at this point, but um, yeah, he really pushes me in that way and also just like makes it accessible. Like he's trying it, like I want to go support him. Like, of course I'm going to try it. And <laughs> usually like we can climb on them together, which is really cool, but none of them feel impossible, which is cool. So, that is sick. Hell yeah. yeah. But all of them will be, you know, you got to put the time and, and hard work in. So. Yeah. All right. Okay. Big last question. You ready? This is from Andra Armvika. I butchered it, but it's an Instagram handle that I can't pronounce. Favorite tea? That's a good one. Ginger <laughs> turmeric from Rishi. <laughs> it's a winner. Yeah. I love the ginger turmeric and the brand Rishi is really good. Mm. Not an ad. Just, I just enjoy it. All right. I appreciate you. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, thank you so much. That was really fun. For me too. All right. Bye, everybody.